Facebook. Welcome to the future of DNA.
short pitch about galvanized or so accommodating and very flexible providing this real space for us tonight. So, Roya. Um, hey everyone, my name is Roya. I'm part of the team here at Galvanize. Just curious, um, how many of you this is your first time visiting Galvanize? Okay, wow, so a lot of you. Um, so you're probably wondering, where am I? What is this space? What does Galvanize do? Maybe you've been to an event here in the past. Um, we are a dynamic learning community for technology. So we have entrepreneurs that work out of the space. And then we also have a data science and web development program. So we're unique in the sense that we have members and students under one roof, and that allows for um, cross-pollination um, with projects and um, different things. So the members who work here hire the students. Um, so sometimes the students go on to start companies. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of awesome things that are happening in this building. Um, we also have around you know, up to 20 events a week here on campus. Um, we are in the whole building. We have eight other campuses um, around the U.S. So we are uh, representing across the U.S. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, you can uh, stop by the front desk. I have to head out right after. <laughs> um, or you can go to our website, galvanize.com. And um, we'd be happy to get back to you if you have any questions about maybe being a member here or participating in our data science or web development program. Are there any questions I can answer? Sounds like I covered everything. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Nice. I'll let you take them here. Thank you, Roya. And I uh, really appreciate this opportunity to be at Galvanize. And, uh, I want to thank you all for coming first, and uh, I'm happy to see all these faces here, and I'm sure uh, a lot of people are still coming, so uh, maybe we'll have to be a little closer in, in half an hour or so. Uh, but I hope everyone has enough space, and uh, if you don't, just um, feel free to stand uh, anywhere you like. Um, also, a huge thanks to Group Organic, who provided drinks tonight to us. Feel free to test, uh, test them out for low carb uh, drinks, which are not uh, bad for your health. Vitamins look like. Yeah, and also have vitamins too. Uh, also, before we start, a little bit of housekeeping. So, uh, if you, you asked me about the program, so I just wanted to give a uh, more overview of, of what we're going to do tonight. Uh, so first, I want to have Han, who made it here all the way from San Diego, uh, to give a talk about uh, DNA and uh, uh, dark matter of DNA and uh, the way that what they do in, in their company. Uh, and uh, then we'll have short talks, about 10, 15 minute talks. Uh, from Joe, who's sitting there, from Reese, uh, Daniel, from Dinobank. Uh, also, we're still waiting for Raphael from X Biospace, who's coming. Oh, you're here! First row, bro. I'm right here in front of you. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> so, uh, welcome, Daniel. Um, I hope you have. Uh, your computer ready, I and mean, uh, if you want to test it, you can test it quickly. Um, um, we just give it a reading poll. Um, the, so I'm just going to tell you that uh, where we're going next week and everything we're going to do in the next 10 years. But we're going to have a community to show you like, the parts of the presentation that we're going to do. Fantastic. So, uh, uh, yeah, I'm still looking for it. And Rafael actually has a special announcement tonight. So uh, definitely worth the here's talk. And then we're going to have Leonardo from UCSF. Uh, Leonardo is, uh, is uh, working with uh, immunobiology, immunology, and uh, also uh, with uh, human genomes. So I think tonight's idea is to have uh, covered more uh, a broader range of topics from from DNA research to DNA science applications 
and applications in business as well, and also cover the topics of using blockchain in the field, which I think to many is really interesting how these skills come together. And I think for that, Reese Jones will give a very, very interesting talk about uh, blockchain evolution, which gives a perspective from a different angle towards how blockchains work and how uh, how blockchains evolve. And I think uh, learning about blockchains and learning about uh, DNA, about genetics, and about life sciences in, in more general terms, uh, we can uh, see the future of DNA or the future applications for uh, this more interdisciplinary subject of using blockchain in, in life sciences and healthcare, in genetics and science, maybe. And I think the most interesting part of this evening will be the panel discussion, where I want to have it really open, like really going into questions from the public. I will we'll start with some uh, two or three questions that I prepared and we asked at the Facebook event. But I think after that, we'll just go with the public questions. And if you have any questions, feel free to you know take notes and uh, keep them until the end. Or if the speakers are fine with it, maybe uh, ask them immediately. But don't worry, every question will be answered. And uh, yeah, I hope this uh, evening will be very insightful and we're going to learn a lot about blockchain or life sciences or both, or just uh, share wisdom if you know a lot in the fields already. So um, I want to give floor to Han and uh, I want to thank you again for coming. And one last thing before I forget to uh, introduce myself. So I'm Louis, uh, Louis Mikal, and uh, I organize uh, another event around blockchain life sciences. I organized some events around blockchain before I co founded Sandipia, which is a co living co working space in San Francisco. And uh, as I have a degree in biochem and technology management, I want to stay relevant and share this uh, uh, interest in blockchain and life sciences and share this interest with everyone else and uh, increase the, the knowledge and what we know about these fields. So uh, I give the floor to Han and uh, I wish you all a great evening. Thank you, Vic. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm from very far away from San Diego. <laughs> it's one hour, probably faster than people coming from the Neopetus, uh, all the way from Mount One come up, as it says. So one hour, it's very short. So I do apologize ahead of time because I have to leave about 8.30ish. So I just want to sneak up because I have a flight to catch uh, tomorrow afternoon as well. So uh, um, Louis uh, contacted me because he saw a paper which is published on a, on a cover of Nature, which is uh, called Axolotl Genome. And uh, it's, the, it's the largest genome ever attempted by a human. Uh, it's a 32.4 gigabits. I mean, just for, for, for perspective, human is 3 gigabits. So that's like 10 times bigger than human. And I want to talk a little bit about that. What was that? Yeah. Exolotl is a uh, Mexican salamander. So. And a lot of kids, US, I find a lot of US kids is, is, uh, keep it as a pet. Uh, yeah, it's very cute. It always shows the picture. <laughs> so the reason we map it because it's cute. No, no, that's not that's correct. <laughs> um, so um, um, we we are a company based in San Diego. We are a tool company. So we're like uh, uh, our next door neighbor, our big brother. You know, yeah, Illumina. Everybody knows Illumina. The dominant uh, sequencing world. So we are same kind of a tool platform, genome maps tool platform, but. They focus on a, a single base resolution, very detailed, uh, accurate information. We focus on the structural information. So probably not many people know about the things, but it, so I today will address that. And that's I consider the dark matter of the genome, except like the dark side of the moon. There's another side of the story I haven't been told. So all instruments actually uniquely designed to uncover that dark side of the, the genome. And uh, don't mind there's some Chinese character because I give talks all over the world. Obviously, China is the uh, fastest growing uh, market there, uh, besides that, state China. So the, uh, so the idea is that the, the genome is a book of life, and uh, just to give you uh, some dimension quickly. 
So this is a slide I made 10 years ago when it just first came out. This uh, uh, cell is about 10, 30 microns. Then you see those uh, very highly compact we call metaphase chromosomes. These are a few microns. This is the, the supposed chromosome one, you know, the largest 270, 250 metaphase human being. And then you, you are unwinding those things. There's a lot of proteins there, protein, protein. Then you eventually go to the so-called single, uh, I mean, the, the final fibers. So this is the double strand DNA. So you can see that the building block is the, the ACGT, as you see, but the space between the building blocks is about, about three angstroms. Three angstroms is 0.3 uh, nanometers. The diameter of the double strand is about two nanometers. So that's basically the, the, the gist of the thing. So we have this technology being around for decades, which is called karyotyping or cytogenetics. In the hospital, you have a problem, you know, we cut those things when we were high school, right? Uh, genetics, everybody had done that before. You cut those chromosomes, that little person, that's the metaphase condensed, uh, your, your, your chapter, your book of life, your chapters, that's the chapters. You have roughly uh, 46 of them, and uh, remember half from your father, half from your mother. So you actually carry two book of life, don't forget about that. So on a good day, you have 46, sometimes you have 45, sometimes you have 47, sometimes. That's why I would call Down syndrome or Turner syndrome. Now the other end of a uh, spectrum is the sequencing. You can see single bases, and that's great. But I show is a very classic center sequencing, which is base by base. So really, is a, a, you either see the book, a, a table of content, or you see the sentences or the words. That's the, the problem I'm trying to solve. So this is when I first came out at the There's something in between. It's really uh, 1KB to 10 megabits. There's no good technology to address it. It's like a dark area. Nobody knows about it, what's happening. So I'm going to talk about what's going on there. That's use of technology. That's the, the reason. Now, Illumina is extremely successful after the center. It's doing this uh, 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 Illumina sequencer, which is a, a high throughput. And uh, 10 years, remember, 3 billion, takes 3 billion dollars, 10 years, hundreds of genome centers around the world to finish one human genome. Today's a, uh, Illumina machine able to you know, do it like uh, three, four days with one lab, a few people. And the reason is because they shred that books in their massive fragmented fashion, and then sequence uh, massive parallel read those bases. And the two, uh, 150 base pair to 250 base, or maybe that's the longest thing in go. Sequence by synthesis. The key is you have to sonicate and have shred that book into many, million pieces so you can read simultaneously so it's very efficient. And hopefully the computer stitch back. And this is based on one assumption. Every sentence is unique. Then no matter how thick the book is, it will be stitched back in the original order. <laughs> That's the problem. So, of course, a SNP, we call single nucleotide polymorphism, that's, that's no problem, because your base, your, your read is 100 something base pair, single base change. So our biggest knowledge, the richest knowledge about human genome, always concentrate on that, there's a reason, because we only see those small changes. So, so, so four or five million bases between every person, average, with difference, at least four to five million bases. We know that things to death, but we have very few returns from a medical point of view, so there's something else going on because genome is very complex. So what I want to focus is really the, the original order. So I'm going the opposite of the, uh, Illumina. I think that the Illumina sonication, they, they increase the entropy, so they have some problem there. I want to restore that, just keep it native. So this is what a one chromosome, for example. Chromosome um, 10, by now we'll build this map. So uh, we have a PR, as you know everybody here, if you learn a little bit genomics, it's a PR, QR. All the green bars, the top is annotated gene, all the genes on there, with the position annotated. So there's one big gap ever to see. That's the centromere, has a lot of repetitive regions, so it's just like desert area. But other, other than that, it's all pretty uh, binarily able to assemble this uh, uh, within two days, a, a whole genome map, contiguously from telomere to telomere. Beautiful, beautiful things. Uh, this used to be, uh, could be done in you know, years, years actually. Now it's like three days. So we did what uh, Illumina do in next generation sequencing. We did a next generation mapping and GM. So that's why we did the equivalent job, but uh, we focus on the large scale. So what are we talking about structural problem? Structural problem is the one, if you zoom in there, if you zoom in there, you see that? It's not a single base. It's those elements jumping, shifting places, jumping around. I mean, cancer is a disease of a structural variation because the genome is just, uh, rearranged is so out of a wazoo, it's, like a, it's not a like, human genome anymore. So this genome shares at a structural level, if it's accurately assembled, 
this genome is not 99.9% .9 same as we always thought, because based on a, 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 a SNP model, we have 99.9% right? same. We only, like, a, you know, a few basis difference, a few million out of three billion or six billion, whatever you call it. Uh, but if you look around, we are not 99.9% same. Otherwise, the world peace is realized a long time ago because we are, we're different. <laughs> so that is why structural is, is really changing the genome. That's what I want to address. Very complex. And that's what the, we actually, the easy disease already studied. That's the harder one. That is not just disease. That's the diversity, whatever you might title. That is decides our temperament, our body mass index. You know, why, you know, some people drink water still, you know, gain weight. Some people can eat all day like my friends and never gain weight. So I'm very jealous, but those things are just some metabolic, all kinds of variations that you heard a good gene pool. So the problem is, on top of that rearrangement, there's the worst. The only uh, protein coding is only 1.5%. That's what the protein coding region. The rest is, uh, a, let's say, call it a unique region. That's the part you can't assemble with computer. Then the rest of 60, more than 50% are repetitive regions. It's all the stutter sentences in the genome, scatter over. And that's, that's the majority of it. That's the majority of it. And uh, they actually tend to, they're not just repetitive, they're mobile. You know why? They're like the retro virus. They are the remnants of the virus. You know, we, we like, as a corporation, we're taking over, they start to squat this place. And they start once in a while, they're moving around. And by bad luck, if they insert one of the bad critical genes, you get cancer. So sometimes, that's why the theory, one third of cancer is, a, uh, is, a, is a inherited, two thirds are just crap shoots, just random stuff moving around, and then you get cancer one day. So that is the problem. Uh, plant is worse. For example, switch grass is 95% of the category. Weed is 80%. So, obviously, my, my conclusion is the old Craig Venter NGS uh, uh, shotgun sequencing methods, that's, you know, shredded, high efficiency, you know, massive parallel, high efficiently read and, and rely on believing computer's power to do the sequencing assembly, and uh, that's what you get. Uh, <laughs> you kind of get it, but I, Remember, you remember you have father and mother, so you don't even know there's a male or female, because today assembly, you mix <laughs> them together, and you pretend there's a two book copy of life. And then a doctor would just uh, scoff at us to say, look, most of the phenotype, which is you know, the disease, is really interaction between two copies, the mother side and father side. As you know, the recessive phenotype dominant, you know, if you have a base kid. Mm -hmm. and, and also, let's say you have a 50 copy of a breast cancer, a BRCR2, that 50 copy could be 20, 20, it could be 49 and 1, right? And it could be, you know, 30, 20. That, you know, type's different. So you really have to separate them. So that is why a short fragment approach is not going to work. You really have two copies. Um, that shows, actually, this shows why the deficiency. Today, this JAMA uh, report said, you know, if you uh, sequence the exon all the coding regions, just by sequencing alone, looking for point mutations, your diagnosis rate successfully only 26%. Really, it's, that's all it is. 74 is undiagnosed. And uh, Dr. Stephen Kingsmore is from uh, Ready Children Hospital based in San Diego. He is the best. He has a Guinness record, 26 hours of diagnosis. Uh, he has a, a sequencing facility right next to this uh, ICU. And there's a children, you know, when they're born, have a babies have diseases. And uh, the baby is different. Baby has uh, those metabolic diseases. Actually, if you intervene earlier, you actually can save the baby. So a lot of metabolic diseases if you diagnose earlier. So they have this beautiful program, screen all the 4,000 to 8,000 known mutation, poor mutation, and which costs a fortune. That's not really anybody can uh, afford it. But right now it's a pilot project. He shows he able to save uh, 150 uh, um, uh, family, he able to actually save 40 kids. That's pretty, very good. Because that kid's the rest of the life, uh, they will be different versus uh, developmental dis disorder the versus actually healthy. Because uh, sometimes just a $50 drug can save that kid. And uh, some kids can grow to teenagers still don't know their rare disease. There's a called di undiagnosed rare diseases there. They don't know what it is. So it's really an odyssey. It's a huge burden on society, family, for everybody. So we really want to say, what's that two thirds? What's the other majority? which is, uh, what's that dark matter there? That's what we're trying to answer. So this is one example. A UCLA did a, uh, this called Duchenne Muscle Based Trophy. You see that kid out there on a wheelchair. Obviously, physically, he has problems. But when they sequenced him for two years, they didn't find anything. 
And uh, then when you're using binary map, they find there's a huge 5.1 megabase inversion. Inversion just said the whole thing just flipped around the entire thing. So what does is uh, uh, this gene called DMD gene is the largest gene 2 megabase in the genome is being chopped right in the middle. So, so this gene is swapped to this position, and this gene is swapped to this position. position. And these are the gene the RNA is changing. So it's uh, promoters and enhancers probably all drive different directions, right? So it's a huge problem. That's like a tectonic, tectonic plate problem. But technically, at a single base level, it could be perfect. Because every base is the same. So that's why when you chop it up, you kind of lose perspective. Sometimes you miss these kind of big things. Uh, don't mind this. This is Chinese. All it says, there's a, you know, close to uh, 400 different algorithms out there. Sometimes uh, the results, it's like a flipping coin. Because computationally, purely built on short read sequence is not very accurate. And that's my point also. Sometimes we don't understand the, the text in the genome, which is pretend it don't exist. <laughs> At least I understand, but the, you know, it, it actually means something, right? So in the genome, we have a lot of such text. You don't understand, you don't speak that language, but it's there. And then because we are sure we, we, we miss it. And if we, uh, if we look at this same problem, right? This is green is the SNP, single nuclear polymorphism. Uh, in there, obviously, like two base above, 250 base. 50 base to 1 kb is the, is the, the blue. Then there's a 1 kb above the large structurations, that tiny pi. That's a number of events. But you look at the same problem, flip around. How many bases the impact? Totally change. The smallest pi becomes the biggest pi. You know why? I just show you a one event, impact 5 million bases. The entire SNP is only 5 million. So that event is one base per, per event. This could be multiple bases, at least one KB per event. So you think about the, the impact of the number, the structure variation impact genome a lot more. That's the earthquake, right? The SNP sometimes is like a pothole on your highway on your way home, not one on one, but that's earthquake. So that is why we cannot just only focus on SNPs. And that's why if a reference genome said 90 KB, that's 90,000 bases. You know, we're talking about Illumina will never get to it. You have four copies. Because binary molecule never broken, we actually can, your eyeball can see it. They call eyeball algorithm. You can just see it. A five year old kid can see it. You can see that pattern there, repeat it, and it's like a, a long line. So I was giving an analogy earlier talking about it's like I'm going to a business trip, I, I sit in a hotel room. If my vision only can see TV and my bed, I close the door, I have no idea which room I'm in, right? Unless you stand in the hallway. That's, I'm, so binary will let you stand in the hallway or maybe outside building. So it's like a illuminous sequencing is like you're getting a graph your room online, but then it'll get you checked in. So that's why you know where the room is. That's the city view or the bay view, or it's next to the you know, elevator, which is happening to us. So people Chinese say, seeing is believing. What are those things? This actually, this random raw image I graph, that's a binary long one. That single blue one is double strand, super long, your bullet train of your genome. A visible in single molecule level, I trapped in this nano channels. And, and this uh, label is those keywords I labeled on this genome. So when you see this pearl necklace, that's a massive amount of attention to repeat. It's that hotel room right there, one by one. That's a small hotel room. And you can see that's a big, that's like a conference room in your next, you know, second floor or something. You know, it's a little bigger. You can see that the moss coat, the bright. Look at this. There's a four dots and a skip, four dots, skip. There's a five copy. There's an eight, skip eight. So this is rampant. These are not doctors. I can pull any image. There's a tons and tons of repeats there. It's rampant. So uh, what I say is a, a sequence is digital, but genome is analog because that's what the, the, the diversity, the, the, the beautiful world it comes from. Because there's all this elastic uh, accordion things going on there. Uh, you have uh, some coding region, but uh, the regulatory region is totally amorphous. It's totally chaotic. So if I do a histogram, uh, I plot the, the x-axis is a, the distance between each unit, uh, repeat unit. The y is the frequency. So you can see, get a profile of the uh, you know, small repeats. And this is like a, what, 10 kb? So this is 10 kb. Oh, this is 10.2 kb. So 10.2 kb in this way, so this is probably 50 copy. What's the green? Green is probably the leopard. So what a leopard has a 10 kb, it has a 50 times. I have no idea why. Maybe that's why the reason can go on the trees. Um, and then you have see this uh, in a human here. 
Human R1 2.1 KPI is a huge spike, and I know only happening in male. In female, never go go above 50 copies. In male, goes sometimes goes to 700 copies. Uh, and then that yellow thing in the background, <laughs> that thing is there is some kind of animal out there, uh, which is so different. And that's why we sequence that genome, and that's why uh, I'm the reason I'm here. Lois called me up. Can you come here about three weeks ago? I said sure. As long as you know it's the cool people here, like can handle this. <laughs> so that's excellent. I want to cover. Uh, 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 it's a Mexican salamander, and uh, you can see um, this thing's uh, 32.4 gig. Next biggest is the uh, uh, white white spruce, 24 gig, so 10 gig smaller. The next is 20 gig, lolly uh, uh, lolly pine, and you can see this is a uh, excellent. Uh, this whole thing is repetitive regions. Uh, this whole thing is called a long terminal repeated retro, trans a retro element. It's a bunch of virus. Virus. And then why we study these things, of course it's cute, but uh, the reason we study is because it's, it's a thousand times more resistant cancer than mammal. It can regenerate almost anything. It, it limbs, jars, tail, spinal cord, spinal cord, skin, you know, burn, burn victims, your 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 parents, <coughs> you know, in a car accident. Yeah, maybe we can restore that. Then they can cut the whole limb hundred times, still grow back without a scar. Without a scar, it's like a memory. And and it, it can uh, transplant its organs without rejection to each other. And it seems the secret is like it remains in larval form forever. It never goes through metamorphosis. Maybe you should have stayed young forever. That's a simple answer. It just never grew up. You know? Like everybody here, I guess everybody here has never grew up. Part of brain can be regenerated. I really wish somebody in my brain can be regenerated start losing my memory. <laughs> uh, obviously, if we can, as a scientist, can replicate any of this magic trick, even one of them, that would be great. So the reason why I, I, I sequence them, the reason why I'm in math, because we want to understand why this is so different. But it seems to point, it seems to, point to this re repetitiveness. The more larger genome, it's not because it's more genes, it's actually the more records for regions in there, with repetitiveness. And uh, so, so obviously, uh, back to the normal world, we already know this from those uh, old days, cytogenetics, uh, doctors always know that. structural information, it always causes diseases, especially mental health. Uh, we'll talk about mental health a little bit later. Um, so, by then, now you probably agree with me. It's like a, if you do only a short sequencing alone, you only see half of the moon, and you will get, you know, Mr. Bean, and uh, use binano, it's like a, I give you back the, the picture on your cover of your, your kit, of the puzzle kit, right? You have the original kit to go into, you can go back. So this is, a, we help them to do the sampling. That's why the salamander people, they initially they didn't include in our technology, and then towards the end they called me up and said, hey, can you help, we just, we just lost. And then we started giving them that picture on the cover, and then we put it together. So, oh, so uh, let me talk about how, how we did it. Okay, how we did it. And so this is technology I did at Princeton ten years ago. Um, long DNA is a long polymer. It's a DNA is a long polymer type of strand, and it's semi-flexible. So I'm trying to explain to 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 people is a it's like the neck the the, the, the chain of the necklace, and uh, the ring is the smallest unit we consider rigid. But if you go further, so it's semi-flexible, semi-rigid. And the, the smallest unit for double-strand DNA is considered rigid, is about 50 nanometer. Go beyond 50 nanometer, it's not a bank. Okay, so it's, it's like semi-flexible. So I need to make a nano-channel to confine them to become a long a train on, 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 on the bar train can like that. So this is a, it's on a silicon surface. I mass a massive parallel a fab those channels. So that's basically that that was the invention. And of course the rest is just a product. Of but look at this thing here. Uh, you can see uh, this is a fluorescent uh, labeled uh, molecules. So the video is not working, but it, supposedly this ball goes inside and it just starts moving around. Uh, too bad, this is the best part. Always should have maybe later. Did you connect to the Wi Fi? Maybe that's the. Well, at least this part is moving. <laughs> Otherwise, I was trying to show you how from the ball gradually. That's the all IP is going. So in the end, it's just I made this ball, a random ball, all 
streaming to a certain mass amount of channel. So now it's like everybody's sitting in this massive train, everybody's sitting in their seats. And if you carry a certain like a fluorescent lamp, I know where you sit. So I basically like the, uh, the five o'clock traffic helicopter looking down. And I, I, I can uh, record the bottles. Yeah. Do you have electric field in your channel? Yes, that's how you drive. It's a negatively charged market. So you just put a small, uh, I was going to show you the first video actually. I can control it, stop. And I can reverse it if I want, and I can't just, I can't see exactly that, but I can't manipulate it crazy. I will find a working portion afterwards, I finish. So essentially, you're, you're extracting A, keep it as long as possible. Remember, I'm anti illuminator so I'm like totally not sonic hitting it. So I'm like, put a, a keyword, fluorescent labeled keywords, like a, you know, in a movie they can say people are whatever. Right. And then, then there's a rare, it's enzyme, so it's a, a rare cutter or a frequent cutter, that sort of thing. So, uh, so uh, three minutes, you put on, a, this thing goes on for 24 automatic, and they start record this, hope this works. So this supposedly goes inside and then take images. So essentially take images of the, the genome. So then the barcodes will change into this, literally like fingerprints. Then the fingerprints will, uh, uh, will sample into a consensus map. Then you compare this one, let's say your tumor versus your own blood. And then your tumor suddenly, every single keyword matches on chapter four, or chromosome three of your whatever. Suddenly there's an extra piece because the tumor acquired a new virus or whatever. Now you see it's there. You know exactly where it is. So this is really a, a, a Google map was top down. If you shoot this picture of this room sent to me, Louis sent me on, uh, on the phone, I will never find this place. It's every room's like this. It's too, 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 too detailed, too localized. I need to look at this. It's on Peninsula, or it's on the Bay Area. It's the west of, uh, of the you know, market or whatever. Those are context information. That's what you need. Context information is what's lost in a short secrecy. So, so back to what it, essentially it's a specific sequence motif, seven base or eight base. This enzyme goes there and bind to a very tight and bring a fluorescent light. That's it. That's basically the way it labeled. It's just we barcodes, we signature, we put barcodes on the genome. And so we have this uh, cliff notes of the genome, really. That's what it is. So that's what it's beautiful track. And then we have the massive parallel. So these barcodes are very unique, represent a certain area, also represent mm -hmm. so everybody's barcodes are different. You kind of similar, but not identical, but different. So, if you compare structural level, we like you know single digit difference, we like a ninety two percent difference. I mean, same, not a ninety nine point nine percent same. So, uh, what I did is reduce the three D problem two D to one D. That's all I did. Really, it's uh, just basically reduce. This is uh, this is the matrix. I just take almost. Uh, I collapse the Z and then collapse the Y and then X X as well. So that's what it is. Then you, I make a movie. So it's uh, it's like a high efficient bullet train network. So this was done at Princeton. Sure, Kelman was the president at the time, first female president, <coughs> non economist, the Canadian uh, And that was me, it was uh, 10 years ago. So what we did is we have this a single strand digitized molecule with the barcode, so it's unique. Then we consensus call the signal. You see, false positive, false negative doesn't show a real signal, it just goes to the background. The true signal shows up a sharp peak, right? But you can see this one definitely signal when only half a height in the wife, half a mother, half a father. So we actually have a half a in this show. So if this one shows 13 kV apart, your reference is only nine, so we have a four kV insertion. You instantly call. So you look at from top down, right? So now you see this. This is a very obvious. A banana turns this a very difficult for sequencing problem. This is an area. 145 kb, that's huge. And this second patient has a two, what called segment duplication. And this person has second duplication but inverted. Just by looking at this, usually a five-year-old algorithm information can do this. I don't need a PhD anymore. So I kind of down down the informatics. And my informatician sh shouldn't be worried because you're not gonna lose your job. Because now you can actually uh, shift your focus trying to get it correct every day, trying to get the genome correct to mine the data to serve, say, why there's a medical consequence. So the, the focus of a majority of the effort actually being simplified to move to do the right thing. So this is what we present is a genome map. Beautifully tells you it's an inversion, 
It's a translocation, insertion, random, repeat, insertion, deletion. So those map and then combine with your sequencing, your data, your data is complete. And so we're doing these things uh, over and over again. We have this machine uh, do it for you in one day. And this is like, uh, hope this works, but uh, maybe not. But anyway, this is supposed to be a machine you can, for the first time when you do experiments, you live, you can watch it in a flow bar. It's like a live flow right in front of you. That was very satisfying. It's just right there. Uh, so we can do uh, about six, uh, 640 to 1,000 gigabase per chip. That's two flow cell. That's uh, three, uh, 320 to 500 gigabase. Uh, so you can do two genome in one day. And that's never happened before. Usually doing this, you do back home. Remember, you have to do physical math. That takes about years and months. And now we shrink it to it. And uh, the bottom is a sequencing context, usually a fragmented. Top is by nano. So we anchor those a fragmented sequencing context to help them find where they are, at least tell them how much they're missing. And sometimes we tell them, for example, this one is totally misassembled, it's not matching, so we, we do point out the errors. There's a lot of genome that helps today is errors, actually, a lot of problems. So this is the long one. So when you have a, a, a sequencing assembly, they say, you know, they're doing a bottom-up, right? So we do the top-down, they do the bottom-up. When we compare, 97% uh, if it's a conflict, is sequencing problem. You know why? Because so we have this uh, single molecule back up. My molecule never broken. And my molecule never broken, just, just like that. That's it. So I know very confident this thing and this pattern, this pattern, left, right is connected. They're using short read, using all of them to stitch together. So sometimes it's just that link is weak. Actually, this sample is good. Only this part is bad, which is stitched together. So we chop them up. So we rescue them. For example, this region, this is a very megabase region, and this bar has a 4.7 kb, repeat 20 times. And it's a 100 kb region. And uh, do you trust this? This is our single market, right? It had a 30x redundancy. If you don't trust it, look at the raw market. You can count them. So my market never broken. So I know this data is true. When I see banana results, I can sleep very tight at night. When you assemble this with an algorithm, there's a 400 algorithm there, every time the sample might not be the same. So, so we are different technology. We are now replacing sequences. Sequence is all here. And we're here, so we are very long. We're 150 KB below. Uh, we don't even look at 150 KB's minimum study. We have megabase long, longer. And uh, my dream is ideally, I look at your entire book, only 46 chapters on a good day, of course. 46 chapters, if it's thread, kilometer to kilometer, there's no informatics anymore. You just, just thread through it, and you see the whole thing. European, I do. They're trying to make tomato uh, a little tastier than American ones. Uh, so they're doing a breeding. So the breeding is essentially moving one gene to another location. They're breeding, the, the, they're going back to the Y berry to incorporate strong <coughs> flavors. They're trying to complete gene pools. Uh, we had a three cover paper last year, Nature, this year, one long. And uh, I have two more science, Nature coming out. A average one, paper, one, one month, we have one, one Nature level paper, one every month. We uh, uh, mapped about 700 unique sequences. And there's some celebrated color face. <laughs> and then we have this direct labeling uh, methods, very cute, uh, very, very good. These are all methods we call making enzyme. This is direct label, we just slap this uh, label direct on, no damaging. So we go to PR, QR, result, no gap. So this is very good. 198 megabase head to, head to toe. And if some molecules so long, 3.3 or 2.3. Four megabase entire molecule is not a consistent map. Entire molecule never broken. That's why I have confidence one day will go to the entire uh, chromosome. So of course we can do epigenomics. People know these things. We can do different colors. So these are the epigenomics methylation patterns. Also you see that repetitive region in map that you know. This is a transcription factor point. So what I invent is the world's longest, narrowest image of Appendorf tube. That's all it is. You decide what keyword you're going to label. So you. I give you, this is a platform, you invent the icons. We have an iPad, right? You, you have uh, all kinds of uh, apps you can develop. So this is what it is. Um, uh, clinical, which is looking for differences, what cause diseases. That's a different game. It's not like an assembly, right? So we find uh, structure variation more sensitive, seven times more than illumina. Typically, illumina large is 200. We can find 1,500, for example. We're even more sensitive than the pack bottle as far as we're looking for large SV concerns, not a sequencing. So we're trying to replace this uh, 
called karyotyping. It's been around since the 1960s. Most famous cases, the BCIA, for example, is a leukemia and you know, virus as a drug, a medical drug called Gleevec, cure that because they found that the BCIA will come from nine, 22 translocations. And that's been around for like 50 years. And doctors have been looking at this very coarse, um, low resolution image, like we look at black, white TV for decades. I want to give them the 4K color TV. I want to give them the automated 4K color TV. That's my dream. So we can do BCA able at a single base uh, resolution here. I tell them this able gene and this BCA gene all chopped in half. The ones from chromosome 9, one from chromosome 22, they form a new chromosome, which is, shouldn't be exist, but this does exist in a cancer patient. And they fuse two genes together, create a new cancer gene, and cause perpetual expression of this kinase to drive cancer. And if the drug kills that, that's it. And so it's very magic. This is another patient from prostate cancer. This is a patient's genome, okay? Look at this genome, very long, and watch this. This one is coming from chromosome Q arm, or chromosome two here, and then this chromosome dropped 13.3 million bases. Just delete it, just drop it. No matter how many genes there, just disappear. And it fuses together, and come here, it translocates, this is, remember, this DNA never broken, okay? This translocates to chromosome five, and the five's Q arm comes here, and then connect to a chromosome five's P arm, which is coming from this distal end. So this is a really, really messed up genome. Actually, majority of the, uh, the, the late cancer is like this. Your genome is no longer a human genome anymore, to tell you the truth, it's a, it's a monster. So we, we mapped all the 100 years we discovered, it's a fusion point, able to do it in one single, uh, potentially do one assay. Um, this one, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time and that will be a few minutes. So this gene called Duftop 20 is very interesting. In the little tiny cute animals, they are single copies. When you go to primates, they get 100 copies. Go to humans, 289 copies. So directly proportional to your brain size. So this is really interesting. This is like the, we call the evolution paradox. Because when you have more repeated places, your DNA is more easy to get confused. So the DNA is not stable, it's bad for them. So, but, because this one increases your brain size, although make you potentially more crazier, but also potentially make you more s s smarter. And so it's highly rewarded, so it's actually preserved. As a matter of fact, the Bay Area here, probably half of people are crazy here, actually. That's, that's why you billionaires. <laughs> you have a higher chance to spray your sperm or your, 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 your gametes, whatever. So I'm saying this is a very interesting human-specific. You actually possibly enrich this. And it's, you never see a, a depressed, a schizophrenic a pigs walking around, but because they only have single copies. So we have so many copies, and that is interesting because that's the only part is a fast evolutionary, uh, it, it, you know, very fast. If it's point mutation, you will never get that kind of an explosive change. All brain, why we're human? Because the structural variation change, structural level. This is a very famous guy, people know. He has a huge amount of this. 177 insertion, and he lives in San Diego. 374. He's in this Mr. Um, this, this one has a large inversion of this one duplication. It's different. This one probably will develop into Alzheimer's disease. Uh, uh, this one is uh, a Middle Eastern person. He's the uh, MHC, you know, this uh, organ transplantation. This is the father's side. He has the 87.5 kb insertion, mother's side 23.7 kb in deletion. So in a single one low side, your mother and your father can have 100, 10 kb differences in one place. So you're talking about two copies of a book. How can you pretend they're one copy? They're so different, okay? And uh, obviously this is a white person, this is a Chinese person. The Chinese person is very similar, you see that? The father and mother is very same. So I was joking, he's probably from the same village. <laughs> <laughs> but the Chinese person don't even have this area white people have. The middle part is a white reference. So you see the difference, ethnically we see a lot of differences. And uh, this is what actually, when we map the genome, we also find a lot of virus in the genome. So we actually accidentally, de novo, find whatever to carry on. You, 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 if you map you, you give me some uh, samples, I'll find all the other stuff that's swimming around the genome because the sensitivity is so high. Uh, and then we go from here, I don't want to talk about it. And okay, this is, uh, this is how I end. So this is a random genome, remember I said uh, uh, the dark matter. So this one, you, you, you pull this molecule out, it's a 6.7 kb, seven copies. See, uh, your eyes can see, right? This one is like different, you pull it out, you blow it out, you see this. There's a, there's a five dots, 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, copy, just keep going on. These are 46, 48 KB. That's not a small repeat. That's a giant conference room repeat. And so it's everywhere. So I, when I go further out, I find this 1.7 megabits DNA are fully repetitive. And then within a repeat has another repeat. So it's a, almost like I'm looking at music sheets. It's all like I start to see the syncopated, I start to see rhythm, I start to see things. So I wonder, in a certain area, they have special notes here. I can see the structure. Wherever this repeat and this rejoint has a little skip here. It's almost a universal hinge right there. I don't know why. I don't know what it is, but it's there. So this gets you thinking, maybe the genome has another encrypted information hidden there. Want to tell us? We don't know about it. <laughs> That's what I'm most looking at colorblind test. So with that, I'm, I'm just uh, end here. Um, this is what you, you were promised and really wish for. You're thinking you're going to send to a, a genome to some company, and that's what you get today. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they don't even know they have four wheels, maybe 2.5 right there. <laughs> so a binary completes your story. So that's my story. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are in sunny San Diego. It's always blue. I depressed. Yes, because everyone gets oh, I need some clouds, but that's how it is. And we do have all the people there. For example, uh, Google is right here. They they, they study this um, aging problem, so they part of our system. They study the naked mole, the little rat, very cute, and, but lives for a long time. Regular rats lives for like, two years. This one goes for like, thirty years. So they can understand. This one. Dupont. The CRISPR cast their corn, like hell, so there's like 10, 100,000 different corns, the different uh, mutation, different, uh, different uh, CRISPR cas movements, so those things. Um, so this is a, 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 so remember, single base, the structure level, different information. So come to blockchain. This could be another type of a, a, a information you can store, DNA as a media to store digital information. So not just base level, it could be block level. There's another level of architecture. So is that uh, I am here. Thank you.
uh, or sorry, validate the pathways that are related to these unique features that led me to talk to the oncologist uh, who was also present at the hackathon. And interestingly, uh, we identified a targeted therapy for the specific features, and this patient is now clinical trial. This was one of the, perhaps one of the most, the fastest way to get to, you know, the pharma switch, uh, not being able to go through the FDA track and really getting a patient into the clinical trial. The problem with this personalized approach is it's not scalable and it's not reliable. Uh, to make a very scalable uh, model, we really need to understand uh, what hands it, what are the uh, top down and more, upon, uh, more importantly, the bottoms up approach in terms of understanding the disease and very patient specific details for those diseases. Uh, so this is something what Marison is really trying to tackle. Uh, and we are starting our initial uh, focus is the animal testing in the preclinical uh, area of the drug development. What it means really is we are trying to focus on re reducing the animal testing that is required to bring a drug into the market or more specifically bring it to the uh, phase one uh, clinical trials. Uh, Verison's platform is really targeting the three main aspects of this animal testing. One is the inefficient, costly, and inaccurate. In fact, uh, only 8% of the drugs that uh, go through the whole preclinical trial to clinical trial are really successful. The 92% is not. Uh, the second is the lengthy drug development. Not many of you may know that the home, uh, there's a lot of time uh, uh, is involved in terms of building the animal models uh, to testing them and there's uh, lots of different kind of penalties that FDA requires in case you use the wrong strain of the animal or they, or they want to use a different type of animal, which is which also adds on to the 15 years of bringing the new drug into the market. And the third is the limited access to the personalized treatment to patients. Uh, rats are not humans and humans are not rats, so are the diseases. So the diseases that you see or we try to manipulate in the animals are not truly representative of what we are, uh, what's happening in the human so on the stages that you see in humans, we cannot uh, replicate or represent in the animals. So we are really trying to focus on that. More specifically, Verison's platform is really sitting in the space where the preclinical animal testing happens. It's more like plant farm, DMPK areas in the farm industry, uh, which is post the discovery and the target identification and right before the clinical trial phase. Uh, the goal is, uh, to create a pre-filter by using a, uh, a platform such as Verisim to be able to run all your discovered drug candidates that potentially may be useful for the patients through a software simulation such as ours and be able to eliminate the drugs that are absolutely not going to work on humans or animals for a specific disease or a variant. Uh, and that, uh, our estimate is, would reduce at least 50% of the drugs and the time and money and also the lives that we are putting uh, in this process. How really we are building is, uh, it's quite complex, but to simply put, uh, it's a whole body software simulation for drug development and validation. What we are really trying to uh, imply here is there are two basic in engines in our platform. One is the knowledge engine, which basically is uh, adopting and um, accessing all kinds of information, such as physiological the systems representation of a body, such as this, or an animal body. Uh, also, a research engine, which is the comprising of different ML features on which these uh, knowledge based engine is being run and which helps in the scalability and the reproducibility of this platform. Additionally, we are uh, in, uh, applying the multi omics approach to create the personalization models. We know what a person, obese person looks like in a model to what an athlete looks like and what the metabolic changes happen due to genetic traits for, and also what the enzymes make a, an impact in, in an animal or a human body. And we are applying that information right into our platform. Uh, if we just talk about the research engine, our framework is an ideal in intersection of these ML features and it's based on three main pillars. One is uh, accessing and uh, validated training data sets, uh, which are publicly available to our customers that are helping us out. 
uh, in the access to those information. The second is avoiding the generalization error to really resist the old fitting analysis in, in a platform, modeling and simulation platform. And the third is the interpretability. We are trying to keep the ML to a aspect that it, it's less of a black box and it's more of the white box to help in the analysis and the diagnosis. So overall, what we are really trying to do is apply over 30 plus modeling and simulation based standard operating procedures that are really being followed in the current pharma world and really um, running it through these ML features which ranges from the target identification to the clinical trials to the real world outcomes translational analysis, which really means that we are real, uh, just de-risking the R&D process for the pharmas and academia to be able to quickly determine what drug is really going to work and in what particular type of patient or uh, type of animal. So there are multiple applications for a platform currently. It, it can be as the uh, straightforward as really trying to determine what the tissue, what the drug concentration is in various tissues, uh, to very specifically how um, human clinical trial data is compared with the predictive analysis uh, for the plasma concentration of various drug or combination of drugs, to more, much more complex uh, approaches where we are really focused on implying uh, applying mechanistic absorption models, uh, which really means is developing multi-region gut models. So, so everything in your body is very complex. It's, uh, it's every, everyone here probably knows that. And how really we are trying to do is break it down and validate each and every process experimentally and how we observe in, uh, in animals and humans. And that's uh, the physiological prediction is what Verisim is really focused on in terms of uh, by oral bioavailability and the absorption rate, which means that we can at the moment tell you all around here how much Tylenol each and every one of you can take. Uh, if, if everyone has a uh, healthy stomach versus if, if someone has an acid reflux to stomach cancer and so on. Uh, also, we are developing very uh, detailed mechanistic clearance methods to really uh, replicate and reflect what happens when the drugs uh, get eliminated, and this is one example of a uh, renal model where we, our current model includes the mechanistic understanding of drug clearance, which also is one of the big problems uh, when, we, uh, when people talk about failures of clinical trials and the toxicity. Um, as to hence a uh, concept, one size does not fit all, uh, and genetic variation is pretty common. And, uh, even today, at the current standards, is uh, we are really trying to do clinical trials with patient population, which is mostly male, which is also the unfortunate part, uh, being able to represent uh, the population as whole, rather than uh, really, if, if we just take this example of SIP enzymes, which are present in your liver, and it's one of the most important ways your drug gets metabolized, and you can see, based on even the information just present in a particular patient, uh, group of patients, you can uh, you can see like how it metabolizes the same drug, and in some cases it doesn't even. You might need to find an alternative for medication. So our ultimate mission for something to really be able to reflect uh, in uh, virtually or computationally is to create this disease model where we are talking about the highest level at the population metrics to really being able to integrate at the molecular level and have an analysis of the information already available to really create the scalability that we are really trying to achieve in the pharma world and also the academia. Um, now is the perfect time uh, because we have so much information already available uh, computationally, things are getting cheaper, there are you know, really good cloud services. What we can do with machine learning now was not possible 15 years, 20 years later, earlier. We have easy access to many open source data libraries. We have information of how a body functions to how different diseases uh, and diagnostics really work. And interestingly, and more importantly, last year, uh, this FDA has been really pushing hard to uh, convey the three R's, which is reduce, replace, and refine the animal studies for the reasons that I mentioned. And they started calling for more support and uh, more scalable in silico models in the clinical trials. So our goal is to be really uh, build the mission that uh, we propose here to create the first of a kind virtual clinical trials 
uh, that needs to be present in more course line settings so we don't have to go out and test in human beings before we test it in a computation model such as this. Um, on the business side, uh, we have early, uh, eight early adopter customers. Uh, and we, we follow a very simple revenue model, which is SaaS, the simulation platform, um, and it's uh, direct sales to pharma and academia, and it's subscription-based and transactional pricing. Uh, finally, and most importantly, I'm not alone, we have a, I'm pretty honored that a fantastic team of uh, computational modelers to biophysicists and AI engineers. Uh, myself, I've spent a considerable amount of time in translational medicine, uh, and have been able to push two drugs in my lifetime in clinical trials, so I understand the space pretty well. Uh, Zach, his co my co-founder, comes from St. Jude's. He's one of the pioneers in terms of pediatric computational modeling. Bo is our full stack guy who really helps in building the uh, right kind of software architecture to build robust computational models uh, around it. Kushal helps in validating and uh, all the different predictions and uh, interpretations of models uh, have also able to maintain the processes that are being followed across different pharmas. Alex is our biophysicist and AI lead, who also happens to have his own AI company, so we're very fortunate to have people like that. And uh, <coughs> if we are hiring, if you think uh, you are interested in solving first principle problems, I, you get excited by challenge, please contact me at info at verisimlife.com. Uh, and if you want to know what the beta testing looks like and how the models really work, please contact us. And thank you. My name is Reese, and I'm going to uh, 
disappears a little bit into more of a theoretical, higher level talk um, than um, that we've talked about so far, um, which is sort of the genetics of blockchain or blockchain as a uh, store of information that evolves and is subject to natural selection in much the same way as, as uh, DNA genetics and, and biology. And these are uh, uh, parallel in that um, the way that blockchain is like genetics uh, isn't exactly the same. And that uh, from an evolutionary point of view, uh, it's a little bit uh, more like it rhymes with genetics as opposed to it's a precise one-to-one -one mapping. And, uh, and you'll see in, in the models how, how it's similar but not exactly the same. And so um, uh, both uh, genetics and uh, blockchain is, is a, a store of information that metabolizes and evolves. And uh, the image on the left is the size of the um, blockchain data, or the size of a, what a node has to maintain to replicate um, uh, the blockchain forward. And the red line on there is, is the size of the, of the human genome, um, which is uh, a lot smaller than an actual um, but it's about one and a half gigabyte byte, meaning eight bits um, of data out of the six million bases, three million pair, three billion pairs. Uh, and, um, and blockchain was that size, or Bitcoin's blockchain, I should be specific, was that size in about 2012. And now uh, the blockchain has grown uh, on the left-hand chart uh, quite a bit um, to uh, about 250 gigabytes. And it's on a mathematical algorithm. So on that chart is here, and it will continue growing um, uh, until about uh, uh, 2140, the year 2140, um, in which case it'll be in the terabytes in size. And so that's, that's kind of the way Bitcoin's blockchain works now, which works on a, a proof of work uh, um, method. And we'll touch on that later. The, uh, um, so how would blockchain, how would people describe a blockchain as or distributed ledger and, and how these crypto uh, things work in that it's a voluntary system that you everybody using it chooses to opt into that system and replicate it and so forth. Uh, it's borderless in that it doesn't have countries or, or whatnot. It's decentralized and distributed uh, uh, in that it, it's uh, all over the world and, and maybe a thousand nodes are replicating uh, the blockchain's core data at any given time, and at least 25 are, are needed to get a, uh, a validated uh, transaction. And it's distributed in that um, the, the nodes can be anywhere in the world and, and they're in multiple places intrinsically, and so the information is distributed in thousands of places, not one bank or, or one uh, accounting ledger. Um, and then it's replicating in that in the case of Bitcoin's blockchain, it replicates the whole uh, data record uh, for every transaction. And then it's a, a framework of how information is uh, stored in a trustable way and how, um, uh, and a protocol for how that uh, you interact with that information and, uh, um, and how sort of the metabolism of it works, in, again, in a trusted way. And so uh, I would suggest that genetics is all of these same things, in that uh, DNA is decentralized, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, it's fully distributed. There isn't a president of DNA. There's not a uh, government of, of genetics um, in that it's uh, the original gangster of fully distributed uh, decentralized systems. And, and it, it's obviously been proven over billions of years to be uh, an efficient way of carrying information along. And, uh, and, and so it's some di somewhat different than blockchain in a few ways that we'll touch on. Um, so information replication uh, in the case of blockchain is uh, it's a distributed ledger, which is just the trades that, uh, you know, I, I have my genome sequence and I'm going to put it in the blockchain all that's recorded in the blockchain is a record of, I put it there, and if anybody takes it out, 
when somebody takes it out. My genome sequence is not in the blockchain. It's over on a separate computer over there. Or the, the Bitcoins that I have, it's just when they go in and when they go out. And that's what's replicated in the, in the blockchain, not the actual data. Uh, that's confusing sometimes. And that's how it can scale in a reliable way. Um, and reliability is key for uh, currencies, especially in that if it's, you're dealing with money, you want to be able to trust it. And in the case of uh, Bitcoin blockchain, it uses a mining algorithm, a proof of work, in that it's, it's very expensive to uh, recalculate each transaction and reproduce uh, the blockchain on a node. Um, and that way, it's, it's difficult to, to counterfeit or corrupt or, or whatever. And the other um, safety in that is by having it distributed on a thousand nodes, even if one hacker <coughs> node were doing it in an improper way, the other nodes would not agree on it and, and it would be rejected. And that's the way you can trust it, that the transactions that are there are, are proven mathematically, they took work to do them, and there's a consensus of, of all the nodes, the mining nodes, that uh, uh, it's an accurate um, uh, representation of history and the most recent transaction. And then how fast that's done in, in Bitcoin's blockchain from Satoshi Nakamoto's algorithms is that's an adaptable algorithm that um, it, it adapts to happen roughly a recalculation every 10 minutes, which means if you're doing transactions faster than one every 10 minutes, uh, they're not going to be easily recorded in the blockchain. And so it's not an ideal platform for doing rapid or small transactions. Uh, and the, the speed that it runs at um, is something that takes a, a great deal of compute power, which therefore takes a great deal of energy use. And so the uh, track on that is uh, uh, increasing in an exponential way. So just briefly on information replication, uh, in the blockchain it's a ledger, and in genetics it's DNA, is essentially the ledger of the species. And the uh, reliability of uh, DNA replication is uh, human genomes is uh, about 10 to the ninth um, uh, bits. And, and so for each 10 to the ninth bits, the replicating machinery of DNA makes an error. And so as you grow from a, a single cell into a full adult, uh, with each replication, there's errors accumulating. And, and that, that's about as good as the machinery of biology has been able to maintain uh, with the energy efficiency of biology. And, and that's one of the limits of, of how much a genome can be. And some plants and some creatures, uh, like actuals, have a lot more than that. But uh, they have redundancy and other things that are, are doing their error checking. And then the, the mining is the way of replicating uh, in, uh, in Bitcoin's blockchain. Um, and the, the adaptive protocols uh, are, are one of the ways that you can trust that the information is carried replicated accurately uh, in, in generations of biology and, and uh, uh, in an energy efficient way. And the efficiency of the system is an important factor both in biology and genetic replication and in, in uh, blockchain. And so that energy in biology comes from predation uh, and, and or photosynthesis. And the energy in uh, blockchains mining comes in electricity uh, for doing the calculations of, of the replication. And this uh, graph in the middle uh, is, is the, uh, the amount of uh, compute power and petahashes that are applied to calculating the blockchain. And you can see that's growing very fast and, and using increasingly specialized chips to do the mining. And then those are put into farms, and the farms are consuming a lot of electricity, uh, even though they're improving in efficiency. And so uh, trust in the code is a really important part of, of making it work in terms of a trustable system. And that the, the framework for how the replication uh, works is that a a uh, cell or generations of cell can trust that that um, replication is accurate uh, or when you're um, reading uh, different uh, individuals or, um, or for example if you're choosing a mate, partly what you're doing is evaluating their genetic fitness 
for the environment that you're in uh, to, and they're evaluating yours. And, and that sort of is the uh, selection process of, of trust of the uh, protocol of evaluating the blockchain of a, of a person or a plant or, you know. Um, and so in the case of blockchains, there's also distributed applications which are using this platform to uh, do smart contracts and, and other sorts of things, tokens like Bitcoin or Ethereum that uh, uh, are um, essentially really simple contracts of, of the uh, irreversible transfer of value. Um, and that's um, without a double spend possibility. And that's a very simple contract. If I give money to you, uh, you can spend it and I can't anymore. Um, and you can have more elaborate contracts that, like real estate transactions or insurance or other things uh, built on top of these blockchains. And, and a, a distributed uh, application or a distributed organization or, or decentralized is something that can run um, without a government, without a bank, in a distributed way, in a network way, across the internet, um, again, without borders, without boundaries, uh, as, as we talked about earlier. And, uh, and so the flow of information in biology uh, is in life is an information flow, and, and so is blockchain and Bitcoin. And in biology, the information flows from the parents through the DNA uh, to the RNA to proteins and, and ultimately to metabolism. And each of these steps takes energy, it has an efficiency issue, and uh, has a reliability and a, and a trust issue. Um, so some of the issues related to information flow uh, is, is the metabolism of blockchains are tokens and apps and things of that nature. In a genome, uh, uh, the metabolism is an ecosystem, like a, an individual or a rainforest or a complex system. And then speciation is where, in this model, where a uh, genome might uh, split into two different uh, species that are initially were the same but then no longer are. Um, and that's more or less analogous to um, blockchains forking into chains. And so these different species of blockchains are subject to natural selection in, and survival of the fittest uh, in the same way as, as in biology, where uh, certain characteristics fit better with the uh, current climate and environment uh, than others. And so in a changing environment, in a changing climate, um, the, uh, not all, there isn't one perfect design always, and there's niches that uh, uh, apply to blockchain as well to suggest that there should be many different kinds of blockchains. And it, if you uh, standardize on one particular blockchain, it's uh, like in farming where you do cloning, where you do breeding, where all of the species or all the individuals of the species are the same sequence. And one of the reasons that biology doesn't do that, and it's usually human intervention that does that, uh, is, is that that um, clone monoculture uh, becomes much more vulnerable to disease or defect or being hacked in the case of, of blockchain. Uh, so uh, Richard Schultes uh, uh, has a saying that I like, which is uh, monoculture breeds disease. Uh, it creates a breeding ground for disease. And so a rainforest being the opposite of monoculture has a robust resiliency uh, that uh, um, it, if it, there were, there's many different species cohabitating. So in the case of blockchain, uh, having one standardized blockchain is unlikely uh, to survive because there are certain niches like a more energy efficient blockchain or a faster one or, or a, um, a lighter uh, computational one. These, these kind of things, there are certain kinds of applications like paying a parking meter where the Bitcoin blockchain is not the optimum solution for that. And so we suggest that there are other species of blockchain yet to be invented uh, that will emerge. And so just like the uh, tree of life coming from a common ancestor, uh, diversifying into microbes and plants and animals, uh, the, the same thing is likely to happen with, uh, with blockchains through a process of forking or a process of, of creating entirely new ones. 
And so uh, these transitions um, are hard in biology. They're also hard in, in, uh, in the blockchain world. And so here's a really complicated graph of, of the uh, origin of, of uh, DNA life um, on this planet and then all of the forks uh, or the speciations that have occurred over um, four billion years, basically, uh, in that all of the different species that are alive now and that all that have come before are cousins of each other. They're related to each other. And so uh, blockchain is in some way related to money, it's in some way related to internet, it's in some way related to databases, uh, in that it has a, a higher trust um, mechanism and a, and a distributed architecture that the biology has already proven that works. But one thing that's, that's different is that biology doesn't remember every single transaction from the genesis of um, um, blockchain or the original organisms, where the current Bitcoin blockchain, it reproduces every single transaction. And so in a hundred years or a billion years, will it be important that somebody bought two pizzas with some blockchain, uh, you know, some Bitcoin, will, is it important to record that and save that and replicate that every time you do a transaction? And probably not. Uh, biology and DNA gave up doing that long ago. And it remembers the stuff that's important for survival and selection, but it, it throws away a lot of information as well. And so, um, uh, like in Darwin would say that it, it isn't the uh, most complete uh, blockchain ledger or, or the most uh, efficient, or, or, um, but it's the one that it can adapt to a changing ecosystem. So as different applications for blockchain come up, uh, there's going to be uh, different versions of it that, that are popular. Um, so as I mentioned, change, changing ecosystems favor diversity in that uh, you can have a particular design that uh, has evolved to fill a certain ecological niche, but these niches change. And, and so uh, being optimized to, to fill a particular niche um, works really well while that niche is stable, but if, if it changes, uh, by regulation, by technical or various reasons, uh, then other designs uh, will will uh, survive. And then there's high levels of abstraction that are already in, in genetics, uh, like memes and epigenetic coding and, and sort of meta-level coding um, that uh, perhaps haven't been invented for blockchains yet, but likely will be because it's also information flow. So in the past, there was um, uh, there's been some sort of explosive uh, rapid changes in, uh, um, in in the diversity of, of, of biological life. So the Cambrian explosion, as an example, half a billion years ago, happened roughly when eyes were invented in biology or sensors. Um, and so right now we're in the very early stages, of, um, the early life of blockchain. And in the future, it's likely some things will be invented or happen or change in the climate or the environment or the ecosystem that will favor diversity. And, and that will, something like a Cambrian explosion for blockchain will likely happen. And so the um, uh, future uh, of this is, uh, is speculative, but uh, it, it's uh, um, most likely trending in that direction. So the further future is um, to consider is uh, we're moving our information, which is limited in how much of our DNA and, and culture can we replicate faithfully, um, to a, a format that can hold a lot more information, millions of times more, and, and still replicate. And so that's a transition of, of biochemical uh, storage of, of bits of information into uh, electric form. And so this may be uh, an emergence of a new species or new kind of life that's electric-based information as opposed to biochemical. And what we are is information in that um, we're in increasingly information that it is digital, that is collected from the world and the internet and, and put back there. And so what defines a person is no longer um, just our DNA or our metabolism or our biochemistry, uh, and, and uh, uh, 
Gregory Bateson has an example of uh, a man with an axe, and that where is the edge of the man with the axe? Is it his hand? Is it his skin? His hand? Is it the handle? Is it the blade of the axe? Is it the forest he can cut down and the things that can burn with the wood from that? The, the essence of a person is, goes way beyond their biological bag. And that's true also in family units and food webs and, and relationships and whatnot. And so the information flows from ge over time, from generation to generation, uh, in, in, uh, which is life in a sense. And the life doesn't necessarily have to be biochemical. And if you consider uh, how information flows in a person, like the information that is me, uh, isn't just my uh, uh, biochemistry today, because most of the atoms and most of the molecules in me have been changed, or most of the cells in our body change in less than seven years, but I still have memories from before. It's just my memories aren't that trustable. They're not as accurate as if it were um, in a, recorded in an immutable way. And so if you think about uh, our biochemistry and our uh, molecular bi biology changing over time with metabolism, our consciousness and our memory and so forth moves along that while the substance uh, changes underneath. And that's like in a wave, the water is just going up and down. It's not really moving forward. And so our life may be uh, surfing on a wave of information that can transition from biochemical information to digital information. Um, and, uh, uh, and that we're more like a wave than we are like a particle. So that's all I'm <laughs> <laughs> But any questions or objections? Or? What do you think about George Church's Mandela economics idea? Well, um, the, the basic, I'm sorry, no George, well, and the basic idea is uh, uh, for Nebula and, and other companies is uh, to have a, a blockchain-based token mechanism that we sequence our genome and, uh, and, and put it into the public blockchain. And then people who want our genome uh, will pay us money in a token to use it. And so the, the missing piece in that is, well, who wants to pay money for my genome? And why do they want to pay money? And would I want them to, to uh, exchange money for my genome? And that's an unproven thing. There, there are examples of, of uh, companies paying money to 23andMe or to other aggregate databases of, of genomes uh, in a centralized way. And whether that can be broken down into an individual and, and who is the buyer and, and what's the value being transitioned, that's the risk of that investment. So it's their business model. It's not like their idea is to giving to give data ownership to individuals. Yeah, which is an ideological thing, which is um, uh, like we own our medical records by law, not not by physical capture. And, and, and the uh, general trend is we own our genome information uh, as, as if it's a health record. And so the regulation is in favor of saying, well, you can choose to make that public but no company can like steal it from you. And so by tokenizing it and, and putting it on a blockchain, you can uh, have a, a place of every time somebody has looked at it or used it, there's a record of that. And, and as I mentioned at the beginning, our genome, even in that case, is not encoded in the blockchain. Our genome is on a computer somewhere, uh, ideally encrypted. And the blockchain just says, you know, I paid to have it sequenced, the data is over here. And if you want to look at it, you have to pay me a token. Um, and so the over here is where is that data and who pays to keep that database running and make sure it doesn't get hacked. And that's a, a, a complexity into that business model. And, and if, if that is Equifax or if that is um, some company that might disappear, well, you know, what, who is responsible? Other questions? This is where I have a problem with blockchain. So when they look at it, they have a copy of that. So they could distribute the copy of that. And yeah. So you can make an, an algorithm that had a, a hash that was maybe uniquely tied to your genome sequence, 
It could be distinguished from others, but um, I don't know that that's necessarily part of their protocol. But it's not the, the thing that most people assume is putting it on the blockchain is not the same as putting it in the blockchain. It's just a record, a ledger of the transactions. Other questions? And I do want to say that I'm next, and I'm jumping off right where he left off because we are actually building a platform to do that, and we are going to be announcing our clinical study, which is going to happen. So I guess. Just before that, I suggest let's take like five minutes break. I think that a lot of people have been like pouring in and out, so if you want to go to the bathroom or just uh, power up on some nuts or drinks, feel free to get them now. And uh, when people are speaking, let's see what you're at. Also, what your question is, you get this? I have the answer to that. Yeah, it is. We were boarding. I know, that's for a bunk of theirs. I'm not sure. Yeah. 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 For yeah. 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 We're talking about the server that they're cleansing. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And he was actually registered in a EPS, EPFL. He was doing his PhD, and we had a lot of similarities in things we were doing and interest. So we talked for about a year, and then about three, four months ago, I visited uh, him in India, and I found out about the things that he had in, the, in his laboratory and what they were doing. So we decided to essentially, uh, for me to become an investor in his company, and we have, and he already had this uh, great team of advisors. And uh, before we really, you know, decided to incorporate the company, um, we started going to different universities, such as Wharton, and introducing what we we're trying to do. So our mission is uh, health and longevity to personalized medicine and biological repair. And uh, we were thinking about tokenizing DNA back in December. Um, I submitted the application to Wharton. We didn't get accepted, so we're just not there yet. But nevertheless, we went there, we started uh, recruiting um, some really incredible uh, management talent. And this is a video of what we actually um, were talking about back then. So let me start here. So we need a volume. Okay. So when it comes to healthcare, there is an abundance of healthcare data. The real challenge is putting it all together to detect these patterns. So we're building a company to detect these health patterns extremely quickly providing the benefit of a health clinic that you own in the most remote areas of the world, while providing you the benefit of understanding it in real time. And that's why we're creating this biospace. We want to develop the technology that is already here to meet our patients' clinical needs, no matter where they are. We want to provide the services to the patients as well as the patients to the healthcare provider using the latest in computer technology interface. So this is the future of DNA, and so I'm gonna let you guys know a few secrets. Uh, they're really, it's really not that big a secret. Uh, so can I say DNA is pretty simple? Anybody can do it. Um, all you have to do is just copy some data from GitHub and just copy the entire page and create contracts. You can distribute it whenever you sell your DNA through Ethereum. Which is why a lot of uh, tokens are really scams. I mean, really, if you're not providing a service, you're not doing anything. Um, so we decided to create a Crescent Innovation Platform. And the Crescent Innovation Platform essentially is a Crescent token, which you receive when you provide, when you get services from our clinic. And our clinic is actually open in Colombia. It's gonna open through our first human clinical trial uh, for curing, or solving, we're, not, well, we're very careful with curing, we're solving uh, sickle cell disease in Colombia. So that's set to kick off this year. And this is actually the announcement for that project. And to do that, we have, you know, we've started some partnerships. Um, can't really go into too much detail because nothing is completely written in the, in the ink is not dry all the way, but we do have a partnership uh, happening with Stanford, who is conducting an identical trial. And we are going to bring patients from Cali to Stanford, Palo Alto, so they can be treated here. So at the very least, that's, we're going to make, we're going to fundraise, we're going to make that happen. We're going to conduct our own clinical trial, hopefully with their help. And uh, the foundation, so the, the foundations for sickle cell disease uh, was actually what kind of kicked off this whole thing. And actually, so before, actually, well, let me introduce you to the foundation. So the foundation essentially, so this guy right here, he's actually the leading expert in uh, the disease in Colombia. And this is his rural clinic. Um, he only has like one patient room. And he's funded by the NIH Colombia, which is actually, the NIH is actually FDA as well in Colombia. And they have, uh, he has funding to, to continue his clinical work for the next few years. And we're actually going to be using some of that money to actually continue. And I'm going to be meeting with the governor of Columbia, the governor and the secretary of health, to discuss fund, further funding this project. Because there are about 15,000 people, this is a rare disease, 15,000 people that have this disease there. So if you remember our mission, health and there's personalized medicine. Personalized medicine, preservation, longevity, and this for trial, the people that have this disease, uh, generally uh, die by before the age of 37. Um, and uh, most of their lives, they, they most, most of them die by 10. And most of their lives are in pain. So these are kids that are dying in pain. Their arms, hands, feet are swollen. They're black kids and they don't, they're the poorest of the poorest because they, they live a terrible, painful life and then they die. <coughs> so, you know, when it comes to a purpose, so, and what happens, most of these people can't afford health care, so they're a huge burden. And these people are not going away. They're not going to go away because it's, a, it's inherited, uh, it's within the genome 
besides this genetic disease. Um, so we think about a half a million uh, Colombians are affected. In the U.S., we know that there's 100,000 people that have this disease in the U.S., but the number of people that have the actual gene, you know, we're talking about millions in the U.S. And what we're going to do is we're going to actually do all the information. We're going to input it in our, our present ratio application using some of the artificial technologies and, and deep learning that we're developing as we speak in India. And we're going to get all the information, and we're going to share it to the blockchain. And we're actually going to input it. So we're working, so the Reishi blockchain is actually going to be announced uh, next month. That's going to be our white paper. And uh, it's actually, a, so we're, um, it's a regular, we're, we're thinking right now of proof of work, and we're trying to get it so that when people use the actual service, the API, the actual software, actually one of the apps, computers, they can actually mine a little bit of it and do that. So it's going to be proof of work, but it's going to be everybody's computer as they when they use our service. And uh, we have to get all the technical specs up, but we think that we will have all the mathematical proofs um, before the uh, next month when we publish it. Because we got a white paper, but it, uh, quite honestly, it's crap. So we can't present it, and we have to we have to get all the mathematical proofs ready and done. Especially if we, we make the announcement, um, you know, we, we already made the announcement for this at Harvard MIT, which is what we open office. So I'll share with you some of the some of our team. So the professor, the doctor, he's the leading authority when it comes to this disease, and he's the only person that's treating patients for free in Colombia. And the name of the foundation is the Fundación Integral de um, sickle cell disease and blood disorders. And uh, I'll show you guys, I'm not proud to see it. Um, so this was actually from Warden this year. So we were talking about here, we defined our mission in our video. And then we actually went to governor, the governor's mansion actually, and we actually talked to uh, Florida. We talked to Florida because that's where I am. And uh, Reese actually talked about uh, uh, two pizzas, the first transaction of Bitcoin was actually in Jacksonville. Um, that's where it happened. The pizza guy was from Jacksonville. And, uh, and the, uh, the future, really, uh, of where all this information is going, and kind of giving it away, is really we feel that ultimately all this information is, turning, is going to a uh, virtual self. That's really what the future is, and that's what we're working towards. So that's why uh, she's wearing a VR headset, and that's why we went to the Capitol with a note that you're going to be with the genetic revolution. How many here are geneticists? In, um, in Google analysis. <coughs> we are at the phase where we're talking about the thousand dollar genomes here. I mean, I know you guys know, but I don't think the broader audience the audience knows this. And when you're talking about tokenizing, now we're talking about monetizing information, we're in the midst of a revolution. So um, the key is not to be limited by just tokens. Tokens by themselves without service, they're crap, they're worthless. It's just a constant scheme if you're just doing it. You have to build the entire service behind it and back it up. So we are actually going to be building our clinics and we're going to be tokenizing information and we're going to be able to provide services using our native native form. And we're actually going to be doing something really good. Um, so I'm traveling, uh, I'm actually going to be touring labs uh, and I leave tomorrow here, that's where I'm going after this. And uh, in our next clinical trial, we'll announce that she's going to be to reverse aging. But we're not ready to announce that yet uh, because uh, at it's full scale because we're, that everything is, is, is being drawn out as we speak. Um, so my board, we actually have a really, really uh, active board. So our, our chief architect, is Steve Chen, um, he's actually gonna be helping us with a lot of the network. Um, he's known essentially for supercomputing from the 80s and 90s. And they don't know the fact, most people don't realize that he was actually trying to do this back in the 90s. Um, they failed miserably. <laughs> But uh, so he's, he's our chief architect, and uh, he has the, the, the architecture to make this possible at the scales that we want. And then Michael C. Wu, he has a, uh, his company, um, Neuroscience, uh, actually, what is his company? Neurodigitech. He is uh, San Diego, and his company is using VR for, uh, for his boxes, uh, brain damage and, and, and stroke. And, uh, and so we're going to be working with him through uh, our methods. So he's going to help us with our methods. And then, of course, you guys already know about me. Um, and uh, we actually have here uh, BP Nyack. This is the, the, the professor who actually uh, owns the laboratory where, that we contracted. Uh, 2,000 square feet, we can do genetic analysis. Um, he's actually working with us for another project that is called um, Nusa Quantum Dot, um, which is in the works. We, we, we want it to be our first viable product outside of this clinical trial that's uh, said to happen this summer. And then, um, 
Let me see what else I can share with you. Uh, uh, so we we actually are working with some other really cool partnerships uh, with NYP. Can we say in companies right now? I'm going to be throwing laps with another um, person in CRISPR. Uh, Stafford, of course, they're going to be conducting the clinical trial. We're going to be working with them. And I'm going to travel to China, where I'm going to solidify. So right now, China is actually the leader when it comes to stem, stem cell replacement therapy using CRISPR um, to cure genetic diseases. They're actually curing uh, cancer. And they're the world authority right now. They're the leaders because they're the only person that actually conducted a scientific trial. Um, so people, a lot of people you know, say that in China, whatever they're doing, but they really are pioneering. And so I'm going to be heading over there with Steve Chen. And we're going to be checking out, because actually he's going to be announcing as well for his own uh, not-for-profit another clinical trial for, uh, for Alzheimer's. And we're going to be checking out those facilities and see how we can actually use the facilities so we can help uh, for support in Colombia. Um, the initial um, trial, um, the, the, the size, you know, we don't know. It's all going to depend on the numbers. We want to send at least, um, we want to send at least uh, five families. So we want to do twins. Uh, you know, we're shooting high, so if we can do twins, send uh, one, one twin to, to uh, Stanford and keep the other one in Colombia, and it's, it's, our, it's our families, of course, you know. So we can somehow work at it, we can do that, that would be great scientifically speaking. Um, but uh, with the foundation, they have an entire, I mean, that, this guy with the foundation, he knows a lot of everybody, pretty much with the disease goes to him. And he's in a place where it's deeply affected, so I'm going to travel there. And the actual trial uh, from us, I mean, you know, this might be too much, but we're thinking about 100 people if we can. We might have to cut it down, but at least 100 people we should be for it. But it all depends on funding. So um, we're, we're going to be launching a crowdfunding campaign because if we can have 2 million, um, two, we're raising 2.5 million. So we can have 2.5 million people with only one dollar each. That speaks volumes to everybody. And, uh, the Wall Street Journal, of course, uh, they interviewed me already. That's who's been a huge critic about the, the, the uh, about people really needing this and wanting to do it. So we're, we're, we're taking that, and then of course we're going to have our, our blockchain. We're going to have our token pre-sale for investors. But uh, we, we we promise that we're going to match every single dollar. We're actually going to sell our VR products with, with our IT uh, team. So we're going to be touring when we sell those products to raise the other funds, and then um, we'll do the pre-sale, uh, the pre-sale for a token, and then we'll do our ICO on the day of the clinical trial. The day that we get, uh, we're working on two publications as we speak. Uh, one is to uh, the, with the Dr. Moreno. He's actually going to update some of the figures out there that have been thrown out by the disease itself and what he's been able to find. And we're going to introduce the concept of actually trying to solve this issue with that publication. And then we're going to have an official hopefully, uh, publication of the nature with Stanford and, and some other teams where we probably want to follow our methods. So uh, nature methods, that's what we're shooting for. Um, but you know, right now, it depends the, the timing as well because we're trying to get this done and uh, started in the summer. So I think that's about it. Um, uh, one well, of the things that I can say at least, we do have a lot more things uh, in, the, in the background and working, as I said, my team. Um, outside of the people that we that you guys see here, we actually have some uh, freelance uh, freelancers working for us, full stack engineers in the um, they, they have great talent, by the way. Um, they are really, 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 really important. So we have, we have some freelance engineers right now that we're bringing in. We do have uh, 750,000 dollars in funding, as we speak. Um, ready for this clinical trial, and uh, we're going to we're going to use that money to 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 get everybody as many people tested for the disease when we open up the clinics. Um, and uh, we're not taking any any venture capital money right now, so speak it's too early. And we don't need it right now, and especially if we have the ICO and the pre sales happening. We feel that we could raise, and we made the announcement. We feel that we could raise uh, 10 to 20 million just on the token sale alone. Once we open up everything, have everything set for ICO. Um, and according to some of the people that I've been talking to, even that's pretty conservative uh, figure. So, so yeah, uh, I have a question. Sure. Uh, just like I, I've been trying to understand, because I hear a lot of like, name dropping and funding goals. Yeah. Uh, what exactly is the technology? Like, what exactly are you doing? Yeah, question uh, ratio. So, yeah. question ratio. Question yeah. ratio is a uh, platform that essentially uh, is built on the Bitcoin. Technology. Crescent. 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 
I put it Maybe you guys open your website. Sure, sure. I mean, we just have it on the announcements. So our website doesn't have a lot of stuff. So we're a week old. I mean, we, we registered a week old. Um, and we didn't announce the present Reiji platform by my name, but on our website, we do talk about it, interestingly enough. So, so, so we are doing so machine learning research and techniques. So we're doing we're doing this uh, with New South Quantum Lab. Genomic data analysis and disease prevention, that's present ratio. Um, New South Quantum Lab, and then all these different platforms of API, that's present ratio. So this will be present ratio. Um, take a picture. That's what we're going to be doing with present ratio. Yeah, okay. because of the blockchain. So, yeah, so I mean, quite simply, I mean, I'm not going to give you the magic sauce, but you know, we're going to do magic with information. But what's going to happen is ultimately it's going to work two ways. People are going to be able to tokenize the information. So, we'll do the DNA analysis that's going to create a contract. We're going to give back a contract of, of, of actual that we did work. So, that's going to give back a token. That within the token and within an application is going to give the people a, a token and actual present within the app. Then the Reishi application, which is the blockchain, information from your doctor appointments, from any type of, uh, you know, if you go get, get checked out, your long health history, once it's been approved, and sent, it's, you can send to our network of blockchain, it's all packaged up and sent up in blocks. We're gonna, on top of that, we're gonna do homomorphic encryption, and we're gonna do calculations on top of that information to give you personal status and data with your doctor. So the reason why we don't have that is because we don't have it ready to just show as a actual video and as an actual display, because we still have to finish our mathematics proofs to make sure that and, uh, the blockchain is actually technology does work the way that we're, that we're doing it. Like I said, we completed it, but I'm not saying we, it doesn't meet the requirements that we, we want to, to meet, and we're trying to do something quality, especially because we're trying to save people's lives. We're playing with people, it's like kids. So this is very serious to us. We're taking it very seriously. We're not, we're not trying to you know, do any shortcuts, especially if we want to keep our partnerships um, that we that we really study. Um, so we're, we're consulting at the highest levels. And if you can solve some of our encryption problems that we're facing, we're looking at you to hire you. So I guess I wasn't going to do any, any recruiting, but if you can solve a problem, we are going to do a hackathon uh, once we uh, actually have everything published and ready. So we'll be hiring them. And I opened up an office in Palo Alto just for that. So if you can solve any of our encryption problems, if you can later hack our entire system, then we have money for you. Because we're looking for you. I got, I got a couple of questions. So, uh, so when you say sickle cell disease, are you referring to sickle cell anemia? Sickle cell disease is a disease that causes sickle cell anemia. Okay, so it's broader than just anemia. The sickle cell disease is genetic mutation. Okay. And sickle cell anemia is for a um, the VR part, I don't understand. Is there some other thing you're doing research on that you're going to use to get money the from the VR part? How does that fit into all of this? So, at the end of Reese's presentation, he did the matrix. He showed us the matrix. Right. What's gonna, what, where is your information right now? Where is, where is your healthcare information? Who's paying to keep up all that data? Where is that information? And who I'm asking about the VR part. I'm answering, your, I'm answering your question. So, the answer to your question is, is that ultimately, your digital self, you're gonna have a digital twin, and that's where you're gonna get all your information for your healthcare provider, because you're gonna have your genome, you're gonna have all your healthcare information uploaded to the system, and if we are fortunate enough and, you know, to have our plans the way that we want to do, they will be within our system in preservation. So we're gonna develop the, the, the technology, the interface, for you not only to interact with your information, but to, to keep your version set. So that's what preservation promises, and that's the that's, that's our take. Virtual you're trying to and that's if you're trying to save kids tomorrow. This is going to be like you know five years, ten years out, right? Because yeah. you're trying to save kids. I thought the whole point of the trial yeah. was to the, to the twins that you were talking about. I think it's a noble cause. Oh, yeah. It's great. I'm a, I'm a capitalist, and at the, same, at the same time, the reason why this doesn't work is because not enough money has gone into it. Not enough people are actually going in and then low because they don't see that they can gain from it. What you can gain from it is something that's even more valuable. We have to figure out all the time ago, and that's information, your big data. That's the value of all of this, and we're going to move on. And I know I've already seen a lot of questions, so I do I do know that what I'm saying right now, we're not really prepared to really go into, and that's outside of my announcement. So we'll just stop it there. But we do have a plan in place to go and, and head into the virtual now, and as, as we speak, um, we're working on, on architecture right now with our advisors. 
um, back there. So and that's great. Just one, just one comment is, in terms of, you know, with that, you don't seem to know the difference between utility token and security token. Utility is great, yeah. but some things like currency, the uses, you know, the uses yeah. that's so there's value to stuff we're doing with some involved services as well. So you said it more than one time oh, that yeah, the type of service. Yeah, we have yeah. an era, XRP, Ripple. I mean, we can talk about blockchain. No, I'm not, I'm not I mean, talking about really that. Really, we, we can go and talk about, you know, security tokens. I, 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 I'm investing crypto. I believe that you're saying that. when you start making a blanket statement and say if it's on a touch of service is bullshit, that's not really true. Well, we can talk about that because the actually protection is actually the service. So yeah, I'm, I'm talking about, about protection. That. So you're, what you're saying is completely out of it because that is a service. You're providing a service by providing what? Security. So security service is Monero, encryption. So that is a service. And those are good tokens. And I invest in them. So I do have money in them. Um, so I know very well what you're talking about, but what we're talking about is something different. People are coming out with scam tokens all the time. They're saying that you can do this with this token, it's really easy, but that's, again, beside the point. Scam is a service too, maybe. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's a Ponzi scheme. Two questions, okay. So, uh, why, why are you trying to do people's uh, work? It seems like suicide is not going to be the And what? Uh, why are you going with people's work? It seems like suicide is not going to be the so I said we're going with proof of work, however, that's not cemented yet. We're trying to figure out essentially what's the best way of minting, or actually like providing proof of stake, proof of stake for minting, and or proof of work. So we are at a point where we need to figure out what's everything within the magic that we have to work, and we're working on that as we speak. So again, the official publication of the white paper is due next month. All those questions regarding that's what we're shooting for is going to be published publicly, so you can make your comments there. And then, even better, we're going to give you guys an opportunity to hack the system because we're going to announce a hackathon. And we're going to give you the opportunity to come in and tell us that we're, what we're doing is crap because we want to hire you so you can fix our trust system. So, we do have money, we plan on raising more money, and uh, we, we're going to get this uh, worked out. It's just the specifics are just not there when it comes to all the technicalities. And I can't really disclose too much regarding um, some of the stuff because we don't have, we don't have uh, everything. You're pitching this to an investor. What's your elevator? What's I'm, not pitching, line, I'm not pitching this to an investor. What's the one liner I can take away from it? You know, I, the one liner, you know, the, the DNA in the genetic revolution is here. I mean, really, $1,000 genome was, was just great. And if you guys haven't been keeping up, ultimately with tokenization, um, that's, that's that's where things are going to be headed because that makes monetizing uh, possible with this and very important. And uh, we're leveraging that, that technology with our AR platform. But you won't be able to raise the ICO with that pitch, right? Nobody well, we, 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 have, we have everything as far as the actual website. So you have to launch the website. I mean, uh, you know, come on, guys, really? No, no, just we're just we're really this discussion to the okay. Q&A. I mean, mm -hmm. so, I mean, so yeah. can go really far with it, and I think it's, it's a really interesting topic, but I think let's well, first finish yeah. the talks and then you know, just have this interaction. So thank you guys for your time. Um, thank you guys for everything, and uh, hopefully we'll have more announcements for you. And uh, in the near future, like I said, we're traveling to Colombia, we're going to get this thing started. We already have one funding for a lot of the things that we can do for our clinical care. And we also are going to do already have some seed funding for us to, to ensure that this continues to be in the dollar. So that's really as much as you can, you can really provide anybody you really, uh, at the very early stages. We're a week away, we're just a week old um, when it comes to what uh, we're initiative. Interestingly enough, the day that I submitted my application, is, does anybody work with Nebula? Nebula Economics? I know Reese says that he had something with George Church. We published, we published this, this information at MIT Harvard, and uh, that next day, the announcement came there for guys. So I'm not, I don't know, but so then that made us decide to actually go and take take this to the push out of it. Because so the next day we announced, I'm like, really? I thought that was a big deal. We're trying to do something, and then of course the church being God and everything, and He makes He decides to do everything we're gonna do. Um, but uh, we're we're taking it in a different direction. And um, they're in Colombia. So one is in Colombia. The one that we're keeping us in yeah, we're gonna do it, and we're, we're gonna do it, and that's that's when I meet the laboratory tomorrow. Um, I guess this guy's competitor. Um, we're gonna we're gonna meet. We're gonna do that. We're gonna be able to come in and do this. Uh, they actually set up the laboratory, set up the FDA, information, and all this stuff. We're doing that already with the company. So, yeah.
So I just have to say, I think you're all over the map. I'm actually an investor and in biotech, and um, and I, I'm involved in VR and mixed reality and all that kind of thing. I don't see how you can say I'm doing a clinic here, I'm doing this here, I'm doing the VR here, I'm in blockchain. It's like you're using all the frontier technologies to yeah. be cool, right? Yeah, yeah. But let's let's put it together. Yeah, yeah. You know, and hopefully, you know, we'll you know we'll, we'll show you that that you know, we hope there will be, that there's no better better way. To, you, know, you can talk all you want, you can do a PowerPoint and show everything to investors. But you know what really solves problems? Actually, doing it. So we're doing. It. Um, so you, know, you can you can see it. So we'll do it. Thank you. Volunteers, citizens, right? 
allegedly with the good intention of uh, centralizing a DNA database for forensic use. So, for me, it's a very invasive uh, uh, procedure, and it's the word I would like you to keep in mind here is privacy. This is uh, another sample. This is this is just happening yesterday. Another story is about this horse. This is golden horse. And I just wanted to ask if this uh, is a Photoshop uh, animal or if it's, it's real, right? So that's, that's the story of the, of the golden horse. So the last question, the last story I want to tell is about the Mexican Oxalot DNA. And here's the lack of word that is here is uh, ICO for research. That, was, that is missing in my presentation. But actually, Dr. Han was presenting uh, previously the new discovery about this actual art, this uh, uh, salamandra. And what all of these cases have in common, obviously, is in, in, one, in, one, uh, uh, in one size, is that in one, in one uh, this, the line of the story is that of course the genome sequencing cost is, is getting down, so it's going to accelerate even more the acquisition of this data. But what really we, we found out is that the blockchain has to be equal to personal access, personal control. And what this, is, this means is that we would like to uh, not tokenize the consent, but use the consent to go and write it into the blockchain. So the blockchain is a very expensive and very slow database. The real value of the, the, the blockchain is the decentralization, the immutability, and the traceability. So you want to write in that database who are you sharing your information with. So you can keep track with transparency and you, you have a law that will be kept by the miners and you will pay them a fee, an expensive fee, for doing that. So, what purpose is that? Well, PeopleSec, which is a very known and very well, uh, uh, well a very, very uh, respectable uh, nonprofit, says that 56% of people believe they have the right to access their own and personal genetic information without going through a healthcare provider. That means I want to, to, to have my information with me, maybe in my phone, maybe in my laptop computer, in a desktop, in a cloud, whatever. But I want to own my data. I want to be able to share it with whatever I want, which is portability, right? So the information actually for us is not very valuable. Where is valuable is the consent. Because any big pharma wouldn't take a risk of using uh, this information to make a new drug discovery. Not even the lawyers will allow that. There's some pros legal procedures behind that, and they will make sure they have all, all the, the, the legal paperwork done before they can use the, that data. Uh, of course, uh, they want to be uh, not liable for any uh, suit. So, what can you achieve by um, having the control? So, by encrypting, we will, of course, uh, as Rafael was saying, there's an encrypting thing. That, that's one service that, that is, I agree with you. So, you will be encrypting your data sets using your private key, right? So, you decide who, how, and, and when someone access your profile in a peer to peer transaction. So instead of, of sending a Bitcoin or an Ethereum, you will be sending a smart contract that has your private key, right? And obviously has the public key for the receiver, and you will make a, a smart contract. So if the person, uh, if the receiver pays, if it's a, a, a donation, it will be a no, no payment, but it, they, both parties have to accept the data, so the smart contract will will be uh, fulfilled. 
So then the transaction will be able to, to go. So the, the, the smart contract is also the consent and it's also the key to decrypt the information. It's both things. And that, as Rafael was saying, is a service. So what, what are you gaining with this? Um, you're spreading the, the value of the, of the database using the blockchain. Who else is participating in this economy? The bioinformaticians and the data scientists. So we want to we wanna bring with the token, which by the way, the, the, one of the main things about the token is to incentivize things, right? It's an incentive. So really this kind of, of databases, if they become useful, is in great measure or in great weight or uh, by, the, by the data scientists and the bioinformaticians that validates this data. So they will be able to uh, receive your information, clean it, curate it, and then receive reward. Right? The token will be a membership token. You will not be able to be paid in that in terms of fiat or, or for services. Maybe you will, but the thing is that the token will will be uh, more representative of the whole value of the system. That's how we uh, are thinking about creating this uh, shared economy. So, because this token uh, will benefit from the inflation uh, that. The, 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 uh, when the value of the token will increase if we succeed on building this uh, database and it start filling with transactions, right? With uh, queries. So if, if, if the information there is valuable, uh, like for instance, uh, using, using these, these queries using a specific phenotype, and, and we, we help the data scientists to find information faster. Like for instance, the project before was looking uh, to have like one specific phenotype. So we want to be like the, the, the phase zero of that, those kind of companies that will enable AI or machine learning or whatever discovery. We want to be a digital notary for them. So we, we want to have the, the data ready with the consent and everything uh, done uh, uh, for, for them. So here's a, like, an example. I mean, it's a token as a membership. So the, the, the users or the participants will earn or buy the tokens to participate in the network. The bioinformaticians will earn tokens by curating or evaluating data sets, and they will have a reputation score. And researchers and labs have to buy tokens to access the biobank after being approved by, as a trusted partner. But there's no transaction fee. I mean, this is a free uh, transaction uh, token. So the only thing is that in order for you to be inside of the network, you will have to have a token. And in order for you to run a node, you will have to have a certain amount of tokens, which will elevate you to another level of uh, membership. So this is a possible solution. Uh, this is what we are designing. So the, the blockchain is virtually unhackable. We are using Ethereum. So we're using a combination of an ERC-20 token. Um, and of course, there's another token, which is an ERC-271 token, which is not fungible. So remember the, the cases a little bit. So for this one. We are talking to a genetist who she, she's working on the 23andMe of a horse, which would be very cheap. Um, so, of course, if you, if you have, sorry about that. If you have a DNA of a, of a high-end horse, you, you want to store it and then maybe share it just for, for purposes of your, like, instance, like selling it there's maybe an expert who wants to, to see it and you just want to control who is accessing this information. So there's the, there's the use of the consent. Again here, I mean, if, so, if, the, if any government wants your DNA, they will have to have first uh, 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 an order for, from a judge because this is private property or it must be considered a private property. And then again, the consent of using uh, just for, for uh, 
forensics uh, and nothing else. And this one, this is the, the case that I believe it's, it's going to be quite uh, a good one. So imagine this kid has, uh, again, the open disease. So we're going to give the notary service of, of having the, the kid's uh, bio bank or, or genomic information. And then with our signature, saying to any institution or any uh, non-for-profit, saying, well, I, I can assure, I can make an attestation, a digital attestation to say that this kid has a disease without revealing their uh, actually ID, right? So just by, by, by signing the transaction, the, this kid can receive the funding from any nonprofit or from any big pharma without uh, protecting his privacy. So we want to do also that. And with this ERC 2271, uh, which is a non fungible token, we can buy the treatment for, for him and in, a, in a very closed loop of money. Because it, this is, it's a non fungible token, meaning you cannot go to any exchange and then uh, exchange it for anything else but for the treatment, which will give you transparency. So basically, we believe that the, the token is, is somehow uh, a little bit confusing. Um, of course, we don't, we don't believe that the token will be like uh, a direct payment. It, it will be more like a stake of the network. And if all participants uh, are engaging each other and we will really create a, a vibrant ecosystem, the, the network will be very valuable. And if you are a token holder, especially an early token holder, you will be part of that inflation effect. And that's what we really expect uh, to happen. So um, basically, that's, that's uh, what we have. Uh, so we will have our first uh, trial, our first uh, demo in a couple of weeks. We already are. Um, uh, we already have uh, medical trans uh, prescriptions because that's how we started. So we are we are uh, putting medical prescriptions in the blockchain, and um, of course, uh, this is our, our possible uh, solution. So uh, I will I will keep you uh, in, in in touch if you can please uh, leave me an email. Uh, or thank you very much. I don't know if there's any question regarding the product. Yes, please. What's your revenue model? Well, the services from for the genomics, uh, it will be they will be paid in in fiat. I mean, by PayPal or so we can accept the information that you already have, like the 23 andme information or ancestry DNA, or we can offer also the the service through our private part. Yes, the, the token is a membership a membership uh, token. Yes, it's, it's just because you are participating. We want you to have uh, a stake in the in the network because, like for instance, the network or the database of the twenty three and meet, only the investors of twenty three and are getting are getting value out of it. Not not the bioinformaticians, not the users. Yes, please. If you have uh, people's DNA information, are you going to be sharing that with the government? Does 23 me and uh, Ancestry do that? It goes into the like the FBI database. Yes, of course. But by being decentralized, you the the, the, the authorities won't be able to subpoena the whole database. They will have user by user, which is very powerful.
Is that the only integration of this type of solution? That's a very interesting topic in terms of blockchain is about decentralizing uh, things, right? So in the best scenario, you will have like to sequence yourself like ten times. Like uh Riz was talking about the twenty-five minimum confirmations of the information to, to, to make it valid, right? No, I understand that. Okay. What I what I'm saying is that uh I don't know self-sovereign identity concepts, you know, when you have basically certain identity that you will be able to link uh, your accounts to that are the blockchain. So that it's kind of my ID or social security number that currently right now uh, as a prototype uh, analogy model. Uh, where I, I'm just letting you know that you should look into this uh, like oh. consensus in New York City. Right. Uh, and then it will be the right way to integrate with the projects that are uh, working on that. And self sovereign identity is pretty much what you're going to be integrated. No, no, I understand. But my point was like, why now do you just sequence yourself one time? It will be like, depending on the technology you use, it will be accurate to be sure. good to the other, right? So, my, my vision is that in the future, you will have like different <coughs> technologies, uh, different data sets, and the more information and the more reference, the, the accuracy of the information is going to go up, right? Because so so that's what I'm telling. I mean, in the in the blockchain world, you need confirmations from different and uh, totally independent nodes uh, com uh, going going to a consent of that the information actually is the same, right? So if you just uh, give one copy to your biobank, the, the blockchain, I mean, it's going to have only the consent, right? In our in our in our case. And it will tell you, you know, this this uh, particular set of data will only be used for ancestry. Okay, so no medical trials, no whatever. Okay, so we, we can only use it for ancestry. But the accuracy of the information or if of the identity, it's it's another set of problems. I mean, we, we are not there yet um, because, as you were saying, and at the beginning of the of the sessions, it says it's an analog information going to the digital. So that's a point of failure, definitely. And, and it's, it's a problem that needs to be solved. That's, that's um, two good questions, but the, after the video finishes, and then we can just have like a big journey with all the participants that you need and we're more beneficial for now. Of course. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Leo. I'm a postdoctoral scholar at the University of California, San Francisco, where I study genealogy. And I would like to start by thanking the, uh, the organizers for inviting me and for putting me the last spot as a speaker. Because so many people here today told me about how you're going to regulate, democratize, commercialize the effects of any revolution and how we manage it. So I think I have the pleasure to tell you one way. 
the future could actually get it done. So my job is to convince you that the future is today. But it actually started in 1954, so I, I think I need power on that. It's not <coughs> catching. Yes, thank you. So in 1954 was the first successful world in transport. It was the king in transport. At the Brigham Hospital in Boston, the Harvard Medical School. And so this was arguably the first demonstration of a new concept in medicine, the idea of regenerative medicine. Regenerative medicine aims to regenerate or replace damaged organs or tissues to restitute normal function. If you think about it, most of medicine today is all about symptoms. If you have some ache here or there, there'll give you something that will stop that pain. But our aim is actually to get the root cause of disease and replace those damaged cells or tissues. So the idea then in return to medicine would be to really aim at the source of that problem. Say, if you have type 1 diabetes, your immune system attacks your beta cells that make insulin, that regulate your blood glucose levels. So if you're missing those, we might imagine we'll to replace those, not beyond drugs to alleviate, like our friends can actually, we'll to replace the cells that are missing, and so on and so forth. And so for this, we need to know about the laws of transplant. It turns out there are laws. So the idea is that that transplant that I showed you in 1954 worked because it was between two identical twins. If were between unrelated people, it would not have worked. And that's what summarized the Nobel laureate work, that if you have two mice, mm -hmm. the animals in the laboratory, if they're the same strain, the transplant is fine. You know, it was a long time, that's that yellow part. But if you try two mice that are not related, they're not genetically identical, you'll be rejected. And worse than that, if you now take that same mouse again, the same recipient, and do it one more time, it gets rejected even faster. <coughs> and so this is what created the idea of this immune system, and they actually process mice over and over and over again until they only differ from one single gene locus. And that gene locus is a very cumbersome name. It is MHC, Major Histocompatibility Complex. And so what this locus, locus codes for is this gene that goes for glycoproteins on the surface of cells. And they're like your passport holders. So a cell at any time has all those proteins inside it being processed by the protein cell. And they'll make these proteins into small pieces, peptides. These peptides are then complex to these MHC molecules and they get presented on the surface of this cell, any cell. Virtually all cells in your body express these molecules. And so they communicate with the immune cells called T cells. T cells have a T cell receptor that can see literally inside cells. And so these T cells are trained to distinguish self from non-self. So uh, that's why I think that's a power in this. I think my computer is okay. Um, yeah, but there's no light. No, it's not. There's no light. Is this working? No. Okay, so that's the same. Mystery solved. Yeah, I just want to take it out of this one.
dream to become true. Part of it is cells. Our body is made of cells. And so if you want to design the ideal therapy, I would argue it's going to be made of cells. And so what some of us are working on right now is to use cells as living choice. You can imagine anything that having three pillars. So the first one would be small molecules like ampicillin or, or penicillin or others that will really great revolution. Small molecules, they got every other one. And they will enter any cell. The second pillar would be antibodies. So antibodies are protein molecules that in turn bind to other proteins very specifically. And so this one's already one step up. And people find a time that they will not work because the field, you know, sometimes scientists are the most conservative people you can meet. And so they thought that antibodies are too big. Well, the molecule is not going to work. It does not follow the rules, uh, the density rules, that the drug has to be planar and like liposoluble. Anyway, not true. Antibody is a big success. Actually, in cancer therapy, you see massive tumors just melt away when you give antibodies against specific proteins expressed on immune cells. And then I would argue that it's about time we enter the third pillar of medicine, and that's using cells. Cells as living drugs. You can imagine programming cells just like you guys program a computer and tell them where to go, when to go, and what to do once they're there. So that's what I focus on, and that's what I, I hope I'll give him a bit of a window of what it is like working at the forefront of this idea. So you have these molecules called MHC for short, and they will once again they will tell to the immune system if the cell that expresses them is self or non-self for. And so what this meant though to be heartbreaking because the idea that we could just go around and you know if you have a missing or a or a non-functional organ, you could just go to anyone and give you a functional counterpart. That's just not gonna work that easy. But we might be able to make it work. So, however, right now, there's huge organ availability problems. Because we have thousands, millions of people waiting for organ disease for a kidney. So many, many people die every year because that compatible organ cannot be found in time. And then those that are lucky enough to find an organ that is close enough to them, that could be accepted, we're doing a good job with acute rejection because we pair all these different genes. But if we look at chronic rejection, Less than half of the organs are still functional 10 years later. So then you, what you do, you go back to the list. So this list, if anything, just keeps growing. Because even the people who successfully get out of the list, they're going to come back into the list 10 years later. And while they're out of this list, they take up to 20 drugs, 20 different drugs every day. Because the immune system has many cell types. I could tell you all night long about the immune system. And so this drug for each one of them carries a different cell type that could compromise this organ that is, you know, life -saving. And so this creates like an ethical problem because where the organs come from. So you, what happens is that you see that poor countries actually the biggest providers of organs for people in developed countries. Sometimes, you know, financial reasons, sometimes for cultural reasons. Like if you go to Japan, not many, not many transplants happen there because it's cultural. Here in the US, there's just not enough of them. So you have this kind of you know ethical problem with organ trafficking. So what would be a solution? for this now chronic like of organs. Well, how about we just make them? We now know, or I hope you know before that, that we all come from a single cell. And then we have a blastocyst that we implant inside your mom's womb. And inside that blastocyst, there's a structure called inner cell mass. That inner cell mass is populated by cells called embryonic stem cells. Embryonic stem cells are very special because they can give rise to every cell type in your body. And so, in theory, we could isolate these cells and put them in the lab. And then if, if only we have the right recipe, we could program them to become any missing tissue that it might have. But you could also imagine, uh, as you could imagine that this also offers ethical problems because you're gonna have to destroy human embryos to obtain these cells. What if we could bypass that ethical problem? <coughs> and uh, scientists from Japan actually bypassed that problem, Shin Yamanaka, Nobel Prize 2012, by inventing what's called the induced pluripotent stem cells. So what they did, they found a cocktail of four genes with programming factors. When you add them to adult cells, it seems to work so far with any type of adult cell that you try, even though some are easier than others to so make it work. But so if you put these four transcription factors 
So proteins that bind DNA and regulate how it's read inside a cell, it can turn back the clock. And so say a cell from the skin or from the blood can now become an embryonic like stem cell. And so now you could then push this idea forward where if you have someone <coughs> with some sort of disability, uh, you could uh, you know, get the cells from that person and make genetically match all targets and say stem cells from that person. And you can create whatever tissue is missing and then that person would be cured. And you know, there's already the business around this. It might not be, you know, it's not as sharp as uh, cryptocurrency, but I would say it's still pretty exponential. So the idea that more and more people are going to the space as technology becomes more and more advanced and becomes easier to make these things happen. But this still is a problem, is that you can now make your own cells or own organs, but what if? There's a problem with instructions in your DNA. And if you just make more cells of yourself, they're going to have the same exact problem. That's not getting at the root of the disease. And I think the most common example of this, and I guess being an immunologist work with blood, sickle cell anemia or sickle cell disease. It was the first molecular disease to be identified. I can't really emphasize how exciting this was, because now you have one single base pair. <laughs> One single base pair change, which in turn changes one single amino acid, really block of the protein, and you see dramatic phenotype. You have a normal, happy red blood cell by conquering transport of in your blood. And with this mutation, that the electricity of that amino acid makes the cells clump and they become sickle shaped. And you know, in some cases, people actually can die from this in less developed countries. They're going to have to the right care for this type of problem. So what if we could just go in like a little tiny scissors and snip out that wrong base and bring the wrong base? Right? Then we get rid of the problem. And you know, this was pretty much science fiction not too many years ago, but now it's possible. It's possible thanks to CRISPR Cas9. So CRISPR Cas9 is actually first discovered in bacteria, that's just the way to do with viruses. Every time a virus enters a bacteria, the bacteria takes notice and incorporates a tiny piece of that viral DNA and puts it in its own genome. So next time the virus comes in, the bacteria knows exactly where to cut and destroys that viral DNA with scissors. In this case, scissors is Cas9 protein. And you know, I'm a human, so I care mostly about humans. And so the first demonstration that this technique, it's not, it's not a technique, but it's not a technique, uh, works in human cells, was provided by two different groups, was Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Dunn on the West Coast, and George Church and Fong John East Coast. And you know, I think they're that and that was still going. But the important thing is that we can now do medicine with molecular precision. Just like you used to look at an x-ray and see what's wrong with this, we can now hopefully look at the DNA sequence and say, what's wrong with this? Can we give you a pill to change this problem in this DNA sequence? And so at the time I was when I was in my PhD, like at Harvard, I was like, well, you know, if we're going to start somewhere, we're going to start with blood. Because no one's going to give you a piece of their brain or a piece of their liver. They're going to give you a bit of blood. You know, you can take those cells out and purify them with <coughs> very high precision because there are so many markers and they all number CD1 through CD3 and only I and a few people know what they all mean. And so we start there. And so all this year, oh, I work in the CRISPR. Sure, but it might not work. And so what I found is that actually this is a review by my roommate at the time, one of the pioneers in this field. And if you see, is that they have all these very important hallmarks, but milestones, but you yeah, have never been done before is in CRISPR Cas9 in human blood. And I thought it was easy, but apparently it turned out not to be easy. And so, so my mission then at that point was to make CRISPR Cas9 work in human blood cells. And what diseases I picked to, you know, to see if it worked. I picked AIDS, which is obviously a complex disease, but you know, it affects worldwide people all over the world. We know how it's caused. It's caused by infection of the virus, HIV which will infect your T lymphocytes, your T cells. So that's why it's so hard to cure this disease. Because this virus literally infects and destroys the cells that are meant to destroy it. So people with AIDS don't die from AIDS. They die from any infection or from cancer that they cannot fight properly because their immune system is severely compromised. And so it's now become more of a chronic disease. You can take, once again, enough drugs. We know a lot about the biology of this virus. So if you take enough drugs, all at once, so you can block different stages at the life cycle of this viral infection and propagation. But you know, some people are luckier than that. Some people actually are born immune to each other. 
It's like they just want genetic product. So they did so because they have a mutation in this gene called CCR5. CCR5 goes for a protein on the surface of T cells that is required for HIV to infect T cells. So as you can imagine, without the cell on the surface, it literally shuts the door on HIV. HIV cannot infect these people's cells. They can be carried, they can pass it to you, but they themselves don't suffer from it. And also, luckily, I guess, we have people walking around with two defective copies of this gene. So we know that this gene is not essential, at least in the modern life of the Northern European, where this occurs at like 0 0.21% frequency. And we knew this could be transitory because of the Berlin patient. So I don't know if you heard of this person, but the Berlin patient is an American. Uh, he was diagnosed first with leukemia and then with HIV. And so he went to Germany and got a bone marrow transplant. And the person who was compatible with him happened to have that mutation as well. And so today he is cured because we replaced his blood with blood that is naturally resistant to HIV because of the single mutation. So my question is, well, can we confer this natural immunity to AIDS? You know, I feel like genome making a kind of paradox, like, confers and is natural. But it's true. So natural immunity, we can confer it. And so, once again, it took some banging my head against the wall, and other people as well, we never were in science. But we found that if we use not one, but two guide RNAs, so CRISPR requires a guide RNA to tell it where to go in the DNA. Otherwise, it's just a blind chain that doesn't really cut. So it turns out that if you use two guide RNAs, you can really go in with the new English when you want to, right? So you can really, you know, operate that gene. It's a, you know, it's, a, it's just a surgical intervention at the gene level. And so where do we do this? We use HSCs, modified stem cells. So it turns out there's many kinds of stem cells in your body, adult stem cells. Each one of them is specialized to a specific issue. And modified stem cells, as the name indicates from the Greek or Latin one of those two, it's a blood stem cell. It regenerates your whole blood. Also, it divides indefinitely. So this is the most convenient cell if you want to do this gene surgery. And so that's what we did. We got our patients, and then actually, even though these cells live mostly in your bone marrow, you now have chemicals that call those cells out of the bone marrow so they go into your circulating blood, so you can collect peripheral blood and have those enriched in these blood stem cells. You purify them. You know, for example, they express C34, one of many CD markers for immune cells. And then you put in the CRISPR-Cas9, and our can is genetically tagged the GFP, green fluorescent proteins, so cells be green, so I can't see them, so I can't purify them using full cytometry. It's a really cool technique where a cell inside a tube, and you go through a machine with many lasers, and then once at a time, it goes through the laser, and the laser will tell me yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. So I can purify only the green cells, only the ones that have the Cas9 inside them. And so when I do this, we become green, there you are. And so we showed that. We were able to do this after all this, you know, protocol improvement and we could use high efficiency up to 50%. Uh, they remain functional. So if you have them actually in a petri dish, they can still become many types of blood, just in a plastic dish. Also, if you put them in a mouse, in a humanized mouse, more precisely, so a mouse, that the time it's on the immune system, so I can put in my, you know, personal immune system. You see that they can reconstitute, again, the most easy markers, they have to believe me that they show they can reconstitute several compartments of the immune system. And it does not have secondary mutations. So you can argue that's a big problem actually and going forward. Before you spread for anyone, you have to sequence that person. Because everyone's gene is different. So whatever off target, whatever sequence is almost like yours, is gonna cause a problem, it's gonna be different from each and every one of us. And so we were very careful and doing this across different people and like sequence of three thousand fold. And we saw that there's very minimal to zero secondary targeting. So again, with this, the idea is that we could use it as a therapy for HIV. It could be a permanent cure for AIDS if you take the person cells and let them with CRISPR. And then this is an important point at different problems because the efficiency doesn't have to be 100% because these blood cells are only selected for. Remember, the problem to start with is that the blood cells are dying because they infect with HIV. If you want to put these cells in, they act in two ways. One, they can regenerate a whole new blood that is resistant to HIV. Number two, they're going to differentiate into T cells that will in turn recognize and kill HIV infected cells. So these cells will win by being able to grow and they will win by killing the others. So that's, I think, an important point and once again, an advantage in blood versus other tissues. So we put them in and then make out a therapy. And so we actually have, we've, uh, yeah, we've, uh, there's a clinical trial with this strategy going on in China right now. 
and we, we license this, but the most time buyers in Massachusetts. So what I want to show you in the last three slides is that we don't have to stop here. You know, I'm an immunologist, and unfortunately I can't really tell you probably what I'm doing, but let's just say that I still do a lot of immune cell engineering, and I'm attempting to re-educate the recipient's immune system to accept a foreign protein <coughs> cell. So, you know, there are specific cells of cells you can go after, specific cells of genes. But I just want to tell you that this does not have to lose it to the blood. There's actually a very cool paper that came out recently from Europe that was a kid with a terrible genetic disease that the skin basically falls apart from the day it's born. It just comes off. But we know what the mutation is. So you can take pieces of healthy skin that remains, isolate the skin stem cells, skin also has stem cells, and edit that gene. And you can grow these big sheets of skin entire in the lab. And actually, the patients in Germany, they send these cells to Italy, a different country. And they put the skin there, ship it back to Germany, and now he is cured. You see, they just apply the skin to different parts of his body, and he's cured. And they actually, they even saw that, much like in the blood. There was a clone, a single cell, that was able to give rise to a whole patch of the skin, and it's sequencing. They can do lineage tracing and tell where it came from. So this is the first demonstration, just a few months old. First demonstration, outside of the blood, of an adult stem cell, giving rise to an entire adult tissue. And you can imagine where that elsewhere. So, but so far I told you about being his own self. What if you want to really democratize this, make the world for more and more people? Maybe you want to make those cells universal. So you could just have a therapy off the shelf. Anyone can go and take these cells that are very good at making cardiac tissue, or pancreas, or liver. So what we did was, going back to this MHC machinery, there's this gene with the microglobulin that if you delete it, MHC is going to make it to the surface anymore. So these cells become invisible to the immune system. And so we did some experiments with this again in mice. And what we see is that if you engineer stem cells and then implant them into mice, you see how if you delete this gene, either one copy or both copies, there's a dramatic decrease in the rate of rejection. And so what this shows is that this is a first step forward in the creation of universal cells that could be off-the-shelf cellular therapies for many kinds of diseases, the ones missing specific types. But in the future, just use stem cells and make organs and have quite delivery. You know, if you have the right scaffold, we can just make a, a kidney or a liver in the lab. And you can ship that to anyone because they're universal. So the same thing, the same way that you have universal blood donor now, can donate blood to everyone, I want a day where we have universal regenerative medicine. We have stem cells that are, you know, they have been through all the body controls, they're very good at making a specific cell type or organ, and they compel them in every way. So I think that's where medicine should go. Instead of curing symptoms, it will really cure the root cause. And we'll go to that for everyone. Thank you.
Great job. Um, so CRISPR Cas has been in use for a really long time. It's pretty awesome what you're doing. What about the off target effects? How do you balance that? My number two question is how do you, do you quantify the type of cells, especially when you're playing around with your own human cells? I know this is futuristic and fantastic idea. How do you combat that? And the third is what do you think about the 3D organs? that are really being built in companies where they're really trying to uh, solve the problem of the time, the immune state system, the rejection, and so forth. So, how would I Yeah, so, so definitely you know, more problems than solutions. But so about the specificity again, I think you can have you know multiple guide RNAs who will cut the same gene. So you could have different people being given different guide RNAs. And so whatever our targets are concerning in one patient, might not be an issue at all in other patients. So I think that's the way to go forward. So, and I think the same becomes so cheap, you saw the graph, where Moore's law is up here. It's really way behind the time. So I think that's the solution, right. sequence of patients. And then number two was the... Um, uh, quantification. Uh, so how do you balance like the amount of CRISPR needs to be? My PhD is in this, so one of the mm -hmm. biggest things was I don't know how much editing is happening to really mm -hmm. control the off target effect mm -hmm. or make sure the cell stays mm -hmm. alive. Well, you, you do experiments, right? You titrate right. your amount of uh, RNA, your amount of Cas9, and uh, again, like every cell will be different. Right. Like, once again, blood cells at the time at least were more uh, challenging because if you think about it, immune cells evolve to reject anything that is nucleic acid because viruses is a middle of DNA and RNA. So why would my immune cells be happy about someone putting DNA and RNA inside them? They think it's an invader. <coughs> That's what made it especially harder. But now, what people do nowadays instead of the art is not using DNA, but using Cas9 protein, and then the guide RNA RNA wrapped around that. And it's what a ne negative charge. And then you put these cells inside a little cube, a little cube, and you sap them with electricity. And when you do this, the CRISPR Cas9 machinery goes inside the cell. It does its job because the nucleus and cuts DNA and disappears. So there's no immune rejection of anything. So the DNA is gone. So once the study is done, it's going to get degraded like any other protein. So that's the state of the art. So I think there were some papers recently about how Cas9 is immunogenic. Well, of course, it's a bacterial protein. But if you have your cells expressing that you're protein when you're an adult, your immune system might complain. But if you have a uh, protein already made. And then the three really organs. Uh, it's very incipient, so what people actually are doing right now is using pigs. Because pigs have organs similar size to ours, and then they're going through great lengths to engineer the pig genome to get rid of endogenous retrovirus and of their, uh, their HC. So if you in theory try to have a human or human like organ inside the pig, then harvest from that. But once again, ideally you just want to have a scaffold, which is also being done in there. Uh, I'll go back there. Um, so I can take out the uh, same genes from the cells that are new, for example, the injection. But the more of some of the models where the cells can be possible cancer risk mm -hmm. and viral infection. Yeah, excellent question. So we run the risk of making a virus sponge. Right? This cell gets inside the cell, you just sponge up all the virus, and there's no issue to present those viral peptides. So your immune system won't know what's going on. Right? So, and then also for cancer, right? Cancer will also have mutated proteins. That immune system can tell because remember, T cells can see inside cells. So, as soon as you have a mutant protein, you have mutant peptides, this plague, that cell is dead. So, so two possible you know, avenues to explore. One is you could have a suicide gene engineered to the cell. You have a synthetic contraption that if something starts to go wrong, you can deliver a drug that will kill specifically those cells. One idea for some of these proteins called caspase involving cell death. And the synthetic contraption that you have uh, two halves of the dimerize and become an active caspase when you get this drug. So you can do this drug and those cells precisely will die. That's one idea. Another idea is what I'm actually I'm working on, which is uh, maybe you don't want to long engineer the graft, the organ, you want to engineer the immune system. So for example, let's say for transplant rejection. We know what it is that the immune system sees as foreign. What if I could convince the recipient's immune system? to see that antigen that MHC that is foreign itself. So there's actually a subset of immune cells called regulatory T cells. They're like the generals of the immune system to make sure no immune response goes overboard 
And so if you could engineer those to now tell our sequence immune system, this is yours, this is fine. That might be a preferable solution for many cases like this. In your other knock of B to M, so basically they stop exporting proteins to the surface? Only that specific one. So only CC35? No, uh, only the MHC. So only the MHC. Maybe I went too fast on that. But so MHC uh, is alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3 domain. That's the heavy chain. But that alone does not make it to the surface because there's some processing in the endoplasmic particulate. So it needs two more things. It is the beta 20, this small protein, to go on the side and not stop. It is a peptide. Once you have these three things together, the protein is clear and cannot go inside the surface. So you can imagine if you delete the beta 2 microglobulin, mm -hmm. the cell not cannot go to the surface. And the cells seem to be healthy. One thing that does happen in the mice is that beta 2 microglobulin is also involved in iron transport. So well, when you make a whole mouse deficient in beta 2 there are small deficiencies, but the mice run around just happy. So you know, I guess for some of these genes, I should say for CCR5, while I'm at it, you know, the same a phenotype is also not completely true. It actually gives you higher, um, you become more susceptible to West Nile virus. But I, I don't think most of us are exposed to that kind of virus. Though. So it's safe within an environment, I guess. So just to cut short, I think that I'm going towards what my colleague is asking, like, if you engineer cells that stop presenting MSC surface, how you are going to have these cells that can I mean, those cells are going to escape in, escape in mono yeah. So it's like, uh, I don't, I mean, I see the innovation, but I don't see the point of having a pool of cells that are on top of that stemic running around that they are able to escape in, in mono vigilance if they can have somatic mutations and go through. Yeah. Yeah, again, well, one point is you can engineer the immune system instead. If you have a limited number of differences, between those cells and the recipients, you can spot those differences and engineer immune cells of the recipients to, you know, let those differences go. Another idea is I actually spent a great amount of time thinking about this and, uh, and, uh, in pregnancy. In human pregnancy, if you think about it, for nine months, there is a bee that is 50% foreign to the mother. And yet he lives there and gets nourished fine. But if you are to like take even a piece of skin from the dad and go on the mom's skin, it gets rejected. So the mom is very <coughs> immunocompetent, but there's something about the fetus, about the fetal cells, that induces tolerance. We call it immune tolerance actively. So if we knew, well, and I already know a few, the molecules that induce immune tolerance actively, maybe we don't need to deal with MHC at all. We can have the entire MHC complex in there, plus some molecules that will induce immune tolerance and you want it to be local just like the fetal tolerance is local so again there's no ideas of exploring it so it's very good questions mm -hmm. okay so I think uh, since we're running quite behind the schedule what I suggest is let's take a couple of minutes break I'll try to move these tables away and then let's have like a 15 or 20 minute discussion like all together. But I think it's going to be more closer than just sitting at the tables and having a panel. It's very less people than in the beginning, obviously. All right. Is that good? Yes, yeah. All right. Yeah, of course. I think uh, we can come on the stage. And? Um, no, no, I don't. Yeah, I was
Yeah, look at the French Morris and so they were off here. Yeah. 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 Let's just 